What's up, everybody? Welcome to Global Climbing Day 2020. Um, this is the fourth year for Global Climbing Day and um, arguably probably the most interesting, dynamic, difficult year. Um, every year as part of the North Face's Walls Are Meant for Climbing campaign, we ask gyms around the world to join us in working to lower the barriers to entry in climbing. While we can't beat physically this year, the goal remains the same. Uh, celebrate the community we love and the ways in which climbing can be a tool to create a more inclusive and equitable world. This Global Climbing Day, we're celebrating leaders pushing for change and engaging the climbing community in a series of real conversations about accessibility, inclusivity, and the future of climbing. We'll have three conversations today interspersed with some incredible videos that highlight the work that's being done um, from these organizations and others uh, around the world. So here's a full schedule for today. Our first conversation will be about climbing and community impact with Memphis Rocks and Climb Malawi. And there'll be a short intermission after that where we'll be highlighting some stories from Memphis Rocks and also from Paraclimbing London. Um, after that will be our second conversation, which will highlight summer from the Brown Ascenders and uh, Aaron from Indigenous Women Climb. And that conversation will be about community organizing. After that, there'll be a second intermission, which will highlight uh, an organization by the name of All Rise. Um, and it will include uh, Ashima from the North Face athlete team. Immediately after that will be our third and final conversation for the day, which will sort of wrap it all up um, in a conversation about making gyms more accessible and inclusive with Coral Cliffs a climbing gym in Florida and uh, with an organization called Paradox Sports. So let's jump into our first conversation, which is with Memphis Rocks and Climb Malawi. Um, Memphis Rocks and Climb Malawi are two not-for-profit organizations and climbing gyms in very different parts of the world. Uh, both are working to engage and support their local communities through the climbing gym. Um, today we have Tyler from Climb Malawi and we have Malik and John from Memphis Rocks with us. Um, welcome, welcome guys. Super stoked to have you here. Thanks for joining us on this really important climbing day. Thanks for having us. Um, so I'd like to do a little bit of introduction, you know, just briefly with each of you about you know, maybe a little bit about your personal background and, and climbing and um, and then we'll go from there. How about Tyler, why don't you just give us a little bit of background about your personal climbing and um, just kind of quickly uh, what led you to Malawi? Sure, um, thanks for having me. We're really excited to participate today. Um, I'm originally from Canada. Uh, I started climbing in 2011, um, and it was the impetus was really to um, build community. Actually, uh, I had moved to Ireland at the time and was looking for ways to um, build community, and it kind of became my uh, de facto way of making new friends whenever I moved to a new place. Um, so I've been doing that since 2011, and it's become kind of the, the big passion of my life. Um, my wife and I always wanted to work um, in Africa. We had done very extensive work before in various countries in Africa. Um, and so in uh, 2018, um, my wife found a, um, finished her residency as a doctor and got an excellent job um, in Malawi. And that's, that's what took us over there um, while I was consulting from kind of more of an engineering background. Cool, thanks. Uh, wow, really interesting. Um, Malik, my brother from South Memphis, from Soulsville. What's up, what's up, Sam? What's up, world? Thank y'all for being here with us. Um, for those who don't know me, I am Malika Marston. 
I am a up and coming outdoors adventure photographer by the way of Mr. Bronx. Uh, the way I came into the tournament is if you look in the John Fox window, right behind him, there's a wonderful film called Mr. Bronx. And in 2018, that's when I was introduced to the, the outdoors in a different manner than camping. Uh, since then, I've grown in a community for climate. It has impacted my life and career. Uh, and it's just amazing to consistently challenge myself in a different way. And I'm glad that Memphis Rocks is here to do it. Thanks, bud. And um, John, why don't you tell us, uh, you know, how you got into climbing, how you sort of got into climbing gym work and how you ended up at Memphis Rocks? Cool. Um, I, I started climbing back in 2004. Um, you know, some weird stuff going on in my life. Kind of had an empty void and uh, climbing filled it. Um, I, I want to say that the the first 10 minutes I was hooked and then since then I've seen how it how it kind of helps not only build relationships but um you're able to work on problems and and uh and get through life together with you know your other climbing friends and that's ultimately what brought me to Memphis Rocks was once I heard the mission um I just wanted to help people through climbing and uh and serve so cool well thanks you guys um so we'll jump right into a series of questions. Um, I think that I'd like to start with um, Malik. Malik, will you describe the community uh, there in South Memphis? Um, you know, the community of the climbing gym is obviously one component, but then the broader sort of feel and vibe of, of you know, where you were born and, and raised. I was born and raised in South Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and 38106 is a zip code, and it's one of the poorest zip codes in America. Uh, there's a multitude of things that made it get to that destination, but it is basically an underserved community, but it is a very tight-knit, close community. Because of the lack of resources, uh, people lean, lean on each other a little bit more than in physical life. Uh, we all lean on each other. We all network heavy, and it's just very much so close and network and close in many other communities. The gym helps broaden, I mean, it helps close any gaps between uh, the underserved and resources. That's one thing that Memphis Rocks outside of time that we really try to do is service the community needs first. And um, being that I was born and raised there, I know many of the constituents and the people who occupy the neighborhood. And uh, we just always try to keep that close knit. It takes a village mentality to keep this thing going. Because uh, a lot of things, what we're going to talk about this morning, will seem unsustainable when you put everything on one person. But when we look at it as a community, and these are all of our villages, these are all of our children, um, we can see that many can make it easy. And it's beautiful where we come from. There. Thanks, bud. Um, hey, John, do you want to follow up from sort of taking what Malik said about the neighborhood and... Um, sort of elaborate on why the gym uh, was built there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you if you want, we, well, we wanted to build a gym that was accessible to everyone. And, um, and when you think about that, there are, you know, folks from underserved neighborhoods are not going to go to other neighborhoods where climbing gyms are typically built these days. Um, they need underserved and you know minorities need to go to places where they feel comfortable and they walk in the door and they know that they feel comfortable um and you know a lot of the underserved communities don't have the resource to even have a car so how are they going to make it to the other side of town so uh, we were very intentional on building it in their neighborhood so they they can walk here they can get here they can eat here they can do everything that they want right here and not have to have any other barriers or stress. Cool. cool. Uh, yeah. Thanks, John. Um, hey, Tyler. How about how about that same question? Why Why is the gym? Why did you build the gym and create this um, organization there in in Malawi? Uh, why is it there specifically?
Stand by, folks. We're just having a little bit of audio difficulties. Uh, let's see if we can get Tyler back on. Sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah. Um, the the short answer is that um, it was built uh, there in Malawi because that's that's where I was living. Um, I had just moved to Malawi and I built a home wall, and that was really the start of um, Climb Malawi. Uh, we've very much a grassroots organization. Um, and it probably wouldn't have started at all if it wasn't for the work that Memphis Rocks is doing because I was aware of um, Memphis Rocks and their model uh, before moving to Malawi. And as you know, more and more people um, from very diverse backgrounds started to come and visit our um, climbing wall. And I saw the community opportunities grow and the self-empowerment that was happening for individuals as well as um, the relationships that were happening across significant cultural gaps as well as socioeconomic gaps, um, it, it seemed like a tremendous opportunity to do something um, inspired by the donation-based model that, that Memphis Rocks is, is leading the charge on. Oh, that's, that's really cool. Um, so I guess I'll follow up that question, and maybe this is a moment where we can cue one of the videos from Ed. Um, Ed is, who is Ed, Tyler? Tell us about him. Is he, he's your partner. He's a native Malawian. Um, yeah, Ed is um, uh, one of our um, program directors. Um, he has got extensive experience guiding groups um, out on mountain excursions. Um, most people kind of leading uh, or leaders within the Climb Malawi community are, are kind of volunteering and have other day jobs. Um, and you know, Ed's background is in water, sanitation, and hygiene um, within the NGO sector in Malawi. But his um, side passion has always been getting out into the mountains and taking other people out into the mountains. So when I first met Ed, he was um, doing a lot of guided camping and hiking trips. Um, and just latched onto climbing and has become kind of our one of our major champions doing a lot of networking, outreaching, building links with other organizations and um, taking groups out um, out to the crag. That's awesome. Um, and I'm psyched uh, that we have some we have see these pre-recorded answers to some of the questions today. But I think it's worth mentioning, you know, uh, he he didn't have strong enough internet right to join us today. And, you know, Malawi, I think I've learned from you, Tyler, is the fifth poorest country in the entire world. Um, you know, we take things for Internet, like we take things like Internet for granted here. But um, Ed couldn't join us today because uh, he can't even get decent enough Internet. So do you have anything to add about that? Yeah, just for those who don't know, Malawi is a small country in, in southeastern Africa. Um, near Mozambique, Tanzania, and Zambia are kind of bordering countries. Um, and yeah, the internet quality is, is spotty at the best of times. We usually have several different networks that we're relying on in case we have to switch from one network to the other. And um, to, uh, to make sure things go smooth, we just got him to record some messages for us today. Cool. So like the question that I think we have um, is how did you engage your community to bring new climbers into your gym? And uh, I think that we're going to put up now a, a video from Ed. Is that going up? Rock climbing is still an alien activity in Malawi, a pursuit reserved for the crazy white fox. To get new climbers, we have got four approaches. One for every pool of new climbers we get, we identify at least one person who we give our special attention in hope that they will bring in your climbers, an ambassador of sort to the different groups of people that we have, both local and foreign. Two, because of the simplicity and affordability of bordering, we have popularized the sport and so that we can attract even the, the poorest among us. All we ever need to get things, to make things happen, are the shoes, the chalk bags, and the pads which have been donated to our gym from people of goodwill. Three, we have also had the dealings with music festivals where we have set up a small wall in order to showcase ourselves. And lastly, uh, we have a Guyenda volunteer program which uh, brings in new climbers, especially those who cannot afford to pay 
membership. Rock climbing is still an alien activity in Malawi, a pursuit reserved for the crazy white fox. The good new climbers we have got four approaches. One for every pool of new climbers we get, we identify at least one person who we give our special attention in hope that they will bring in new climbers, an ambassador of sort to the different groups of people that we have, both local and foreign. Two, because of the simplicity and affordability of bouldering, we have popularized the sport and so that we can attract even the, the poorest among us. All we ever need to get things to make things happen are the shoes, the chalk bags, and the pads which have been donated to our gym from people of goodwill. Three, we have also had dealings with music festivals where we have set up a small ward in order to showcase ourselves. And lastly, uh, we have a Guyenda volunteer program which uh, brings in new climbers, especially those who cannot afford to pay membership. Okay, so we, just to emphasize Ed's importance, we decided to run it twice. <laughs> um, but it's really cool to have him uh, here and participate with us um, that way. And uh, I think I'd, I'd be stoked to have Malik kind of take that same question. Malik. How do you? How does Memphis Rocks engage um, the community to try to bring new people into the building, um, either for climbing or anything else? So the thing, like a lot of times, especially during this time, uh, diversity and inclusion is something that the whole industry is pushing. And when we initially brought the gym to South Memphis, rock climbing was a foreign concept to my community. Uh, there are no rocks in Memphis, not even boulders. You know, you can like throw one chunk of some glass or something, but uh, not something to climb. And to get people excited about climbing and to actually get the community to come into the gym, we had to go into the community. We handed out flyers. We went to local corner stores with a dude standing on the corner. We interacted with them and let them know that this was a service there for them. It was a resource there for them. And just overall, it's a safe space that even if you aren't into climbing, come check it out. Um, come hang out for a day, you know, use some Wi-Fi, come in and get some air one day, come get a smoothie and a break from the heat one day. Uh, we just had to show the community what we had to offer. A lot of times we're gonna, you're gonna hear these discussions going on nowadays. And you know, how can we get the, you know, more minorities involved? You have to go get them, make them feel comfortable and like bring them into uh, your organization, your gym, or whatever have you to the outdoors. There's a gap, we all can acknowledge there is a gap. And we all have to ask ourselves, what can we do to bridge that gap? Whether it be on an individual basis, someone that you know personally that you bring into the fold and or you have an organization or something that can actually go out and recruit people. Um, it's no different from when we came into hiring. A lot of times when you walk into a climbing gym, you won't see too many minority staff members. And if you walk into uh, Memphis Rocks, the vast majority of our staff comes from South Memphis, walk to work. That means that like we literally intentionally set out to hire from the community, um, not to be biased to anyone else. But, you know, if it's a communal resource and a job opportunity, we would like the people who live in there to be able to benefit from it. And we purposefully uh, may reached out to the community to bring them in. And I suggest mm -hmm. you know, everyone has that power. And it's just a little uncomfortable at times because, you know, we, you know, it's some difference between, you know, different groups. But once you start talking, all that melts away and we're all human. Beings. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks, Malik. One thing that strikes me, uh, and I, I don't know, maybe, John, you can touch on this. Like, the gym employs, like, more than two or three times the amount of staff that it actually needs uh, to – kind of keep people off the streets and in the building and in the safe space is that is that about right yeah i mean we definitely we definitely have more people per shift than i, I think any other gym does but it's it's not just um it's not just about like gym operations i mean we have different service programs going on all the time um 
we have to have three or four people for our after school program. Um, you know, we, we get hit with about 100, 120 kids a day after school. Um, we have a community closet that people can come get toilet paper and body soap and clothes. Um, so we have one or two people stationed over there. Um, we've had a produce program. We have a free lunch program. Um, so we just, we have all of these things going on and sometimes at the same time. So, you know, there will be times where we have 15 people working at once. And, uh, um, and I guess that service costs money, right? So we have to, we have to all come together and, and help each other out with that. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. It's so much more than a climbing gym. Um, Tyler, how, I'm curious about how do you engage with the community and try to bring people in and introduce them to climbing when they have no idea what it is or had never thought that it would even exist somewhere near them? Yeah. Um, as Ed mentioned, you know, there's um, a few different ways we go about it. We've gone out with flyers as well. Um, when we set up our wall in a new location, um, we went door to door with flyers um, and invited everyone to a big barbecue so that they could come check it out. They didn't have to climb. They could climb. Um, at that point, it was um, really you know, beneficial that we'd already been operating um, as sort of a home wall, backyard wall for a while and had um, a good cohort of um, Malawian um, climbers who could um, show other Malawians the, the ropes and, and make sure that they felt comfortable and um, even, uh, you know, if somebody isn't, wasn't fluent in English, be able to, um, encourage them in, in, uh, Chichewa, the local language. Um, we've also gone out to festivities, to festivals, um, with, uh, we built a portable wall, um, to kind of showcase, you know, the event it can take apart and fit into an SUV. Um, and, um, when we go out to the crag, um, all the, the rocky areas are near villages and farms. And so we invariably get a large um, group of youth who follow us around and just watch. And in some cases, you know, we just share our climbing shoes with them. And, you know, we may not, I may not speak the same language fluently with anyone and we're still cheering each other on, um, trying, uh, trying to challenge ourselves on the rock. Mm, that's cool. It's like a combination of creating the space in one regard and then really deliberate intentional outreach yeah. um like malik was saying that can be uncomfortable at times but just needs to be that effort almost to 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 go out into the communities and to um have these conversations that build these relationships so it's kind of like a layered approach and if i can add one of my lessons learned from doing that recruitment initially was i just focused on kind of the foreign climber versus local Malawian um, divide when I did my recruitment uh, initially. Um, and what I ended up with was a, a strong group of Malawian men who are climbing. Um, and if I was to start this over again from the beginning, I would have been much more intentional about trying to recruit Malawian women um, because that's still a, a smaller group than, than I'd like to see in our community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so we're kind of uh, nearing the end, I think. One thing that I, I really want to make time and space for is um, to hear from each of you all about, um, you know, what is important, you know, John, what is important uh, about Memphis Rocks to share with the world? Like, what is it that you want people to know about the gym and the, the surrounding community um, kind of like your strongest uh feeling and, and reason for for the gym's existence um i think that uh i think that climbing gyms you know we we all say that we're building community and i, I think that everybody can do more and part of community is is helping each other and serving each other so i i urge everyone to, to do more help people um and uh and let, let's all help each other as well. I mean, I, I feel terrible, you know, like we, sh we should have, uh, Tyler has said that he, he looked up to our organization and I feel like we should have worked with him more and I feel terrible. And uh, Tyler, we will, we will help each other. <laughs> um, so let's help our community. Let's help each other in the industry. And, um, and, um, 
and if you're not in the industry, help 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 all of these organizations through through donations and financial support because we all need it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's going back to kind of what we were talking about earlier. Just it's not about climbing. Uh, climbing kind of like the entry point, but you, you guys have made that the entry point to do all these other very rich and important things for the community. Um, Malik, do you have anything that you want to add? Anything that you want to leave uh, people with about Memphis Rocks or about Soulsville or about you and your work? Yeah, um, I just want to say that Memphis Rocks, me and my work in Soulsville are all uniquely connected. I came to Memphis Rocks. I was, I'm a photojournalist. I came to Memphis Rocks to do a story and I stayed because I saw the potential that the building had. There was not one route on the wall. I uh, personally, you know, I just want to say thank you to Tom and his vision. I want to say thank you to the industry and like, you know, the brand for um, bridging the gap between us when we were a young organization. And like the first Global Climate Day in 2018 is when I met Conrad Anchor. And he is now my, you know, my mentor. And just the, 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 the purpose and the ability to have one chance. You know, a lot of times doors are closed when you're from my neighborhood. You don't have a lot of opportunity. And just by, I started at the front desk of Memphis Rocks, worked my way up as a photographer, and now I'm director of social media. And none of that would have happened if it wasn't for like people like John who gave me a chance to even work there. And <clears throat> I just want to say, you know, thank everyone. If you think anything we've ever done at Memphis Rocks is good, uh, if you like any picture outdoors that I've taken on my exhibition with the brand, uh, please become a reoccurring donor. Like it doesn't have to be much, one dollar, five dollars, ten, but it seems insurmountable to keep this going when you put it all on one person. But if we all look at it as it's a village and it takes a village to raise a child, and if Memphis Rocks is our child or Climb Wally is our child, and we all do our resources, then if you think it's changed my life, what it's done for me, just imagine what these boys can do in years for every kid that comes through there. Or like every the representation I get. Uh, minorities in the industry, like there's black kids who walk into them and say, I ain't never seen nobody climb and take pictures before. And the first person that they see climb and take pictures with black like man. And that is very heavy. Um, and it is very important for it. And I just carry that with me every time I snap the shutter. Um, so I just thank y'all for the time. Follow me on Instagram. It all helps. Leap Mark there. You know what I'm saying? Every like, I'm just trying to spread my work as far as possible and get on as many peaks as possible. I just thank y'all for my time. Today. Thanks, Malik. You know, that's that's interesting. And I, I think we have a, a couple more videos from Ed, and one of them is about um, how climbing impacts individuals. And it, it sounds like, you know, a huge part of your, your life as it looks now, you know, was impacted by Memphis Rocks and climbing. And I just, I think we should loop in Ed here to hear, you know, what he has to say about how climbing is impacting individuals in Malawi. From what we have seen, climbing has brought together individuals from different backgrounds and fostered strong bonds of friendships among among our climbers, something which never would have happened under any other circumstances. Um, these interactions have transformed our community by breaking barriers and um, shaping our ideals more learning and understanding for the local climber who is less traveled, more, more exposure and, um, and recreation for our host communities and, and more culture and indigenous knowledge for the expert who is working in Malawi or is just visiting. Cool. Um, so thanks, Ed, for that. Um, Tyler, I'm, I'm curious... You know, we've talked about sort of the obviousness of how a climbing gym or a, a new climbing community can um, have some impact. But, you know, like John and Malik and, and Memphis Rocks, I'm just kind of interested on, on the less obvious uh, or almost unexpected effects that the gym and your organization has had for the, the community there um, in Malawi that you guys are. 
Yeah, um, you know, I think there's several layers of impact that happens uh, with climbing. There's obviously an individual impact that, that it has on us. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen that with um, incredibly strong Malawian women who have said um, after, you know, climbing a few times that they thought of themselves as weak. And like, we're talking multiple pull-ups, like, strong ladies who've just climbed for the first time. And they're, they're saying like, you know, now we, we felt our strength fully for the first time ever. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's an individual level there of impact. Um, and I think climbing and the climbing community fosters um, an, an attitude of self-development and self-growth and overcoming challenges. Um, and, and that builds into a community of support with each other. Um, and, I think for Malawi, especially um, because there is such a big gap between visiting foreign aid workers as one of the fifth poorest, or as the fifth poorest country in the world, a lot of the, the country relies on NGOs and aid work. Um, and, and those individuals who work for those organizations probably make more in a week than a lot of Malawians do in a year. Um, and so there's these power dynamics at play and there's no real place elsewhere in Malawi where people are getting together um, who might be a farmer and a doctor um, and having um, an, an equal playing field um, socially where none of that matters. And, and that's exactly what we've seen where we have um, a Malawian farmer with not the best English who's got the, the focused attention of a, an American surgeon who's learning how to boulder from, from that Malawian because he's done it longer than, than the American. Um, and, you know, these um, exchanges across these gaps are really um, transformative. Um, just to give one anecdote, um, one of my favorite crag snacks is dried mangoes and Malawi has a phenomenal mango season. And when we moved there in 2018, we didn't see any dried mangoes. No one was doing any food preservation with that. Uh, we started to see a little bit of it as we left, but you know, people I talked to were, their minds were blown that, that this thing I had, I had brought Trader Joe's mangoes that were with me and, and people went crazy over them and couldn't believe that this, this stuff could be done and, and it could be become an income generating, it could be a business. Um, so, you know, it's, it's when you mix all these different people together that these ideas for, for new businesses, for new ways of viewing life and, and new ways of approaching challenges um, that can really transform communities, I believe. That's really cool. Um, thank you for those stories. I, I, um, I'd like to shift into another video from Ed, which is, I think, kind of, you know, his message to the world about um, Climb Malawi and what you guys are doing over there, um, how, you know, he wants to share the, the work that you all are doing. So can we cue that one up? As uh, a young community in a poor country, we rely on donations to keep our work going. And the expertise of seasoned climbers who are not permanent residents of our country to pass on their expertise to our community. Uh, our climbers, they, they, they come and go. And we are aware that there is no substitute for learning from professionals. So we want the world to know that climbing is a big thing in Malawi now. And whenever you're passing through, we would very much appreciate you looking us up before you come so that you can see how you can help us. You can help us by rendering your skills and knowledge in our skills development program, um, donating some cash or gear, or just by climbing with us. So thanks, Ed, for that. And that brings up a really good point about how people can get involved with uh, Memphis Rocks and Climb Malawi. Um, definitely follow the organizations on social media, um, support them and see what they're doing there. Obviously, Cash is King. If you can make a donation, however small, it's really helpful to them. Um, it goes directly to helping people in those communities um so definitely you know reach out connect with them follow them um tyler is there anything that 
you wanted to add uh, with regard to, you know, the message that you'd like to share with the world about Climb Malawi, you know, things that you want people to take forward, um, knowing about, about your work and what you're doing? I think um, we've hit a lot of the highlights already, but I will say that, you know, it's why I'm so excited to have this conversation with the guys from Memphis Rocks is I think, um, you know, at, at one level we're essentially trying to do the same thing. And we're um, through a donation based um, climbing gym with all these other extra programs and services, we're trying to, to serve a community. We've chosen climbing as the tool to do that. Um, and, um, you know, John and the guys at Memphis Rocks are doing that um, in one of the richest countries in the world and one of the poorest communities in one of the richest countries in the world. And, and we're trying to do it in one of the poorest countries in the world um, and, and seeing a lot of community transformation. And I think that um, these could be models to be replicated in, in other parts of the world and other communities um, with you know, proper support because you know, climbing gyms don't just pop out of the ground. They, they require an upfront capital, but I think that once the, that's, that's in place, the community itself can actually sustain um, the operations, but we need help getting started. Um, everything we've done is through um, crowdsource GoFundMe because as a foreign NGO, we can't get grants that are for USA or European organizations. Um, so anything people can do to help us kind of grow, um, our community can sustain and, and be transformed. Thank you. Um, that leads me to kind of like one final question for you all. And, um, you know, as a part of participating in today, um, the North Face is contributing money to your organizations. I'd just be stoked to share, you know, if you have any plans for that or what uh, existing programs or even new programs or ideas do you have um, in the cooker that, you know, um, you need you need capital for? John, do you want to feel that one? Yeah, um, so we're, we're not necessarily going to use that money for new programs. We're, we're kind of extended on on everything that we're doing at the moment so it's i mean it's going to basic operations um like i said earlier service costs money um so it's going to be going to payroll so we can we can afford to have folks out there handing out free food um uh free hygiene packs like everything and, and hand sanitizer like i said it all costs money and and this is going straight into the pot Thanks, John. Malik, did you have anything you wanted to add or anything otherwise? Um, yes. I just want to say that at Memphis Rock, climbing is what we use to get people's attention. Uh, we are from Memphis, Tennessee, and in Memphis, St. Jude is the leading children research hospital in the world where no children uh, will have to pay to get treated for cancer. And, you know, you see a child with cancer is bad, we want to heal that. What we're trying to heal is a societal cancer that's not as prevalent and not as uh, aware to the public as others. Uh, we use climbing to get people in there and to keep the to keep the, the resources flowing. But like when COVID hit us all, we took a backseat as a climbing gym and understood that our number one, that we operate in an underserved community and that they would be hit hardest by COVID. So like we take our resources and give them to the community where we handed out 200 free sack lunches every day. We have fresh food produce boxes and to this day. We have handed out over 4,000 pounds of fresh food and food to our neighborhood. Um, and all that is able to do to our donors. We're not able to pull that out of our own pocket. And I just completely uh, urge that, you know, everybody can do a little bit. It looks a lot. Uh, St. Jude raised over a billion dollars last year, and their average donor is just $10. And I'm just like, we spend $10 on frivolous things every day. And I just want to. You know, encourage people to look for something because the end of the world we always thought it was going to be like a doomsday bunker, and you go hide out and have your resources to yourself. The end of the world was, hey, I'm low on toilet paper, but can I have some fuel? And it's all of us have to work with each other, and we're going to get through this and continue to thrive. That's all I got to say. Thanks, brother. That was beautiful, and I really appreciate that you brought up St. Jude and COVID. I mean. Um, St. Jude, when, when I visited last year, we, we got a tour 
seemed like such a crucial component of the of the Memphis community and um I'm glad that you brought it up and and also obviously COVID has been such a difficult aspect of this year so um thanks for raising those two things Malik uh Tyler um do you have any sort of thoughts and plans for the for the money that the North Face is gonna contribute to Klai Malawi um do you have anything new that you want to do or or is it sort of similar like you know things that you're running right now are expensive enough and you're just trying to like keep the program going yeah i'll try to be brief because i know we're, we're out of time but um uh obviously keeping uh living wages um for our staff during covid when a lot of the the foreign workers who were um, financing things have have left um we're also um uh, you know, we've, we haven't finished all the construction. We got the climbing wall built, but we'd like to build kind of a community center for a community library and internet access and things like that. Um, but probably the first thing that we're talking about is a minibus um, that'll enable uh, more trips to the crag um, for people who don't have vehicles. Um, cool. Well, friends, thanks so much for participating today. I, I really enjoyed this conversation and just being um being with you all i can't wait to just have this uh live you know forever on the internet and, and be able to have people reference the good work that you guys have done um already and and to continue this work so um big thanks to you all um all right so up next uh we have some videos that tell a story about um the work that memphis rock is doing uh in soulsville as well as a spotlight on a community leader in um england with paraclimbing london we'll return after that for our next conversation uh about community organizing with the brown ascenders and indigenous women climbs so i'll catch you all in a little bit uh hope you enjoy the films thanks for being here Life is heavy and it hurts sometimes. Like when you're young and angry, you ain't got no parents. Like they don't care. You're a young black person and you're poor. It's like ain't nobody making no space for that. Grew, I grew up around shootouts. My dad, um, he was drug power when I was eight. My grandma, she raised me. I didn't know how life was supposed to be. I don't have a relationship with my parents. They were like drug addicts when I was younger. I was raised by my grandma. You know, being a South Memphis kid, she always tried to protect me. She knew what the streets was and what it could do to you. I've been working for Memphis Rock since last March. I was freelancing full time. Like I was living off my camera entirely. Being able to um, start start having a part time, like really gave me a foundation where I could like stop pulling my dreads out and breathe. And um, it means a lot to me. Like it's like an anchor in the community. It exposes so many people to something that generally that you don't get to experience. My man Demond, he had got an arguing with him and his friends. They were like playing upstairs, hit each other too hard. And I uh, just got between them. And like Demond was really mad. My anger, I need, to, I need to control it. People didn't know me, they just like pick on me and stuff. He's just a kid that somebody needed to talk to. And I ain't saying like it's reprimand, but just like to ask him how he's doing. So like when I interacted with him, you know, I just let him know that I did care. I had the bullet in me for about like four hours. I was so weak, I barely could talk. I was in the hospital for about like seven weeks. Malik, he was, he was, he was a good dude, he can't even talk to me. It was hard sitting in the hospital with him. You know, I was going up there every day. I had, I mean, the first few days, I didn't even know if he could walk. The day that he did leave, it felt good to like, you know, see him walk out. Oh, if Memphis Rock never existed and like the timeline kept going on the same path for life, like and he get hit, I'm not anywhere to be found. But he only knows me because the doors are open. Seeing him climb again, you know what I mean, is like amazing to me. He's overcame a huge obstacle. It made me think, think more positive. And it helped me keep me out of trouble. 
can motivate me to be like a better me. It takes a community to raise a child. I couldn't have wrote how I got here any other way, but at the end of the day, it's all on us to look out for each other. Because what I've learned is money is your energy, money is your time, money is so much other things that you can give. And if everybody gives into this, like there might be a Memphis Rocks and more cities, you know, across the country. Jamon is a, he's a good young man. He's raised uh, by a single mother. When I had him, my life totally changed all over again. No matter what you're going through, still tell your child you love them. Because when the street get them, they'll have them start looking different at you. And that's not love. Growing up, I got uh, gang affiliated. I was dealing with some drugs, hanging with some dudes I wasn't supposed to be hanging with. 12 years old, you out here with people that's 20, 30. This, that negative influence, they're, they're replaying your mind. When he first came and told me about it, I realized he was looking like he was lost. This was out the high school for me, or I'm going to high school just so I can stand on the block. We spoke and had a grocery store. If something else came up, something way better. And I love Memphis Rock. It's my second home. When I told my son about it, I let him know that foundation around there is a great thing for you. Memphis Rock brought the potential out of me. Instead of hurting people, it made me want to help people. Instead of taking it, it made me want to give. Because it's people that look up to me, you know what I'm saying? Like kids. And I ain't know that. I ain't never had nobody look up to me before. When I see him working around there and talking to people, it just give me joy to see that. And my mama, like, she want to see me succeed more than anybody. Memphis Rock gave me more motivation, respect, honor, love. I don't have to stoop low to anything. Oh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, in your son's sweet Jesus' name, O oh Lord, I come to you with an humble prayer, asking you to watch over my baby son. Selling dope, this not gonna last for you. This not gonna give you no experience. You either gonna be in jail or dead. I've been happier than, than I've been in a long time. Seeing everybody working hard, pulling together, learning how to love each other. Learn how to live in life. And Memphis Rock is not just a Memphis Rock. It's a foundation of love. Truth, it stands for something. It stands for something. And it's going to be here for a long time. Hi everyone, I'm Anusha Hussain and I'm the co-founder of Power Climbing London. I had the idea to start it up a couple of years ago and Anna Knight, my co-founder, came on board uh, because while I'm a visionary person, I don't tend to have my feet on the ground. So she sort of set up, helped set up all the logistics and between the both of us, we run it. So what is Power Climbing London? Power Climbing London is a social initi initiative set up to help people with disabilities um, long-term health conditions, uh, in, including things like mental illness or cancer. Uh, and these can be anything from invisible to visible disabilities and anything in between. We're really not strict about the definition of disability. It's just got to, if it has an impact on your life or has an impact on your climbing, you're welcome to join us. Um, 
And we basically set up social sessions for people with disabilities. Uh, we noticed uh, the both of us compete nationally uh, as paraclimbers, so disabled climbing, and we both noticed that while there are competitions around the UK um, every every year, we, there just isn't enough stuff for socialising. Um, you get women's sessions in different climbing walls and LGBT plus sessions in various climbing walls, but you don't have disability ones. And we wanted to plug that hole, especially for London. I When I started climbing in London, I didn't know any other paraclimbers for my first year. And that was quite an isolating experience. I didn't have anybody I could ask. Um, you know, there was, I had a lot of imposter syndrome when I first started climbing and it's this sort of the social sessions that we create are really safe. Um, so the way we do it is they're structured in three different ways. Um, you can have a one-to-one -one session with any of our session runners, uh, or you come to a closed group session, which basically anybody who's a member of Paraclimbing London, who is a paraclimber can come and attend the session. Uh, and then we finally have what we call our like big public sessions where we mix paraclimbers and able climbers uh, together and we create little fun competitions where we might challenge the able climbers to climb with blindfolds or climb one-handed or simulate sensory sensory differences for them um yeah there's absolutely no pressure when you come to our sessions so if you felt up to it during the day but when you turned up you're feeling a bit tired or something um then you know what no pressure just come and just come and sit with us have a cup of tea we normally have a little extra space that's that's made for people who need to chill out a bit as well just in case you're a bit knackered or maybe even a bit anxious so yeah it's uh it's all fun we've had we've been going for two years now and yeah we've run loads and loads of sessions and everybody is welcome um we wanted to create it to reduce the barriers part part of the reason for Part of the reason for creating Power Climbing London was to reduce the barriers that people with disabilities do experience in climbing. So one of them is knowing other people with disabilities who climb. Um, you're much more likely to climb if you're a woman or somebody who's LGBT+. You're much more likely to climb if you know there's somebody like you who climbs. Um, much less likely if you have a disability. Not only that, if you're new to the disability world or say maybe you still think yourself as quite able in terms of mo mobile and strong, you might not consider yourself to be a power climber. And, and this is where we can bridge that space in our organization. Um, the other reason we wanted to create power climbing on was to actually create a bridge between power climbers and able body climbers. We want more able body climbers to, to experience what it's like to climb as a power climber, to understand that we are doing the same thing in terms of climbing as them, but we're doing it with less less things so I do it one and a half arms and joints that spontaneously dislocate many others do it with other conditions or other issues um and yet we still sometimes pull off easy grades and sometimes pull off some really hard ones and it's good to get that sense of mutual appreciation and mutual respect um so yeah so far we now run in about five or six different walls in London our posters are up in every single one of the walls where we are present um, we're mainly present on Facebook and Instagram, so you can find us on Paraclimbing London. On the uh, We have a public page and a private group, um, and we can find us on Paraclimbing London on Instagram too. Um, it's free to join. Sessions at the moment are absolutely free to attend. Um, what we do is we just say you pay your entrance at the climbing wall and we run the sessions for free. Um, but obviously we're not running sessions right now because of COVID. So we're kind of just waiting to see when it's safe. We're kind of just waiting to see when it's safe to go again. Um, so there you go. That's us. Come find us. Bye.
Hey everyone, welcome back uh, to Global Climbing Day 2020. I hope you enjoyed those films and the first conversation. Um, moving onward, we have uh, two incredible people here with us and representing their two amazing organizations and the work that they do. Um, we have Summer Winston from the Brown Ascenders and Aaron Gilpin from Indigenous Women Climb. Um, welcome to our conversation, Global Climbing Day. So psyched to have you joining and I can't wait to dig into the work that you all are doing. Hey. <laughs> um, so let's start with Summer. Um, Summer, Tell us a little bit about yourself, about your climbing and how the climbing transitioned into um, community organizing and, and into the Brown Ascenders. Yeah, sure. Um, I feel like I'm a bit of a baby climber in relation to a lot of the people I get to spend time with. Um, I started climbing about five years ago. Um, I was in Texas. It's funny. I uh, was on Groupon and I saw Groupon for like 30 days for $30 kind of a little climbing gym. And I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll try that out. So I bought the Groupon and I was very bad at it, like exceptionally bad at it. <laughs> and yeah, I fell in love. And yeah, so I, I, that started when I was still living in Houston, Texas. And then I moved to California uh, four years ago and I just, climbing is just one of those things that you either love it or you don't, I think. And it got underneath my skin in a way that I just couldn't shake and in a positive way. And yeah, and so I had been climbing for about two years when I started the Brown Ascenders. Um, uh, as our story goes, we went to a Color the Crag Climbing Festival and it's, um, for those who don't know, it's a really beautiful event uh, created by people of color for the BIPOC community. And I just experienced something I never knew I needed, which was climbing with a community of folks who look like me, um, who have, who moved through the world with the same and very similar experiences to me. And I just knew that I wanted to bring that back to um, the Bay Area to Alani territory and create something for the community. Yeah. So, yeah that's me. Outside of climbing, I'm a professor. <laughs> uh, and that's it. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. No, that's beautiful. I, I, um, I'm I stoked to get in a little deeper. Um, mm -hmm. Aaron, why don't you share with us a little bit of your sort of personal journey, journey with climbing and, and sort of journey to, to starting Indigenous Women Climb. Yeah, totally. So, Tansik, Erin Gilpin, it's Higason. My name is Erin Gilpin and I'm a Soto Cree Métis uh, climber, I guess now is, you know, what I kind of call myself. So that's a an identity that I'm just, you know, really owning a guest at this point, but I discovered climbing um, about, I started climbing around six years ago and it was a little bit before that is when I met my, who is now my husband and I was seeing him do this thing and he was, you know, taking photos of, of climbing and kind of like, um, but he was really emitting a lot of more like deeper meaning in terms of what he was doing on the land and, and, and how he was enacting his climbing. So he was actually climbing uh, in his homelands, uh, which is in Brazil, uh, in the Caia Puma Regional uh, region. And uh, I saw like something a little bit deeper than just kind of like a physical sport going on for him because his lens into climbing was really through his identity as an Afro-Indigenous man, as a Capore Cafuzo man. And so I really kind of was drawn into kind of like, well, what is this thing that you're doing? And first of all, I was like, what is this that you're doing? It looks really weird and crazy. Um, but also just, it was a really beautiful way for me to learn and, and meet uh, his home territories and his homelands. And and then it extended beyond that to where, you know, wherever we went, it was a really beautiful and meaningful way for us to get to know 
uh, different territories and different landscapes. And so I, I feel grateful that my kind of entry point into climbing was through a lens of Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous re relationship to place. Um, that being said, when I started to try to learn on my own, um, you know, going to gyms and things like that, it wasn't just necessarily, you know, a lack of representation of Indigenous climbers and athletes, but also a lack of representation of Indigenous knowledge, place-based systems. And um, so like that being knowledge that comes from our direct relationship to land, which informs our cultural, um, I think, and social uh, ways of interaction with one another and to place. And so I was thinking about, well, how can we then create spaces where, you know, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous languages really set the tone for how we access land and how we think about climbing beyond a narrative of conquering or thrill or adventure or taking, but rather through a lens of, you know, wakotoin or, or kinship to place or to land. And so that was kind of the the hope in creating a space of Indigenous uh, women climb. Uh, and it's been just a volunteer based uh, community up until this point. And we, we run uh, youth groups for Indigenous youth and we're moving into programming for Indigenous families, which is just like my secret way to try to get my friends into climbing is through getting their kids into climbing. So we're growing surely, uh, like slowly but surely, but more so we're more interested about um, at least on my end, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about the education parts of it. So talking about, you know, what does anti-racism look like on the land, right? And so these are conversations that I'm pretty stoked to be a part of and to, uh, yeah, hopefully contribute a little bit today. At least, we, you know, um, I met Summer real briefly at the Flash Foxy uh, Climbing Festival. And for me, it was kind of at this point where I'd been climbing for like, four years on and off, but I was like, you know what? I don't even know if this is for me. I just not, I don't feel that drive. And then uh, when I went to this festival, I met these amazing um, climbers and we just like crushed together. It was so amazing to meet folks from Brown Girls Climb and from Natives Outdoors and Natives Women Wilderness and um, Joe Lee, who was there representing the Paihunaru Nations there in uh, quote unquote Bishop, California, and then meeting Summer. So just, you know, that time there was just, an, uh, it kind of threw me into climbing and kind of said, you know, you belong here and climbing also belongs to you. So I, I really uh, look to that point as a turning point in terms of, uh, yeah, I guess calling myself a climber now. That's beautiful, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think in, in just hearing from both of you, um, we've heard some of your priorities um, as people and for your organizations. Um, I'm, I'm gonna sort of move into another question about um, the communal response to you, you your organization. Um, Summer, how, how has uh, it been received both sort of locally where you are, but you know, more broadly and and also there's like a second part of that question which is almost pre George Floyd and now post George Floyd um the how how sort of rapidly the world um turned its gaze to this sort of work and and organizations like yours um mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I from the very beginning, I like literally from the moment I said out loud, I want to start a group. Uh, and I turned to my friend Derek, we were like leaving the festival and we we're on the bus. And I turned to my friend Derek and I was like, I want to start a group. We're going to start a group. And he was like, OK, we're going to start a group. Like literally when I said that, like my friend Mindy was sitting behind me and she was like, hey, like if you're if you're serious, like I, I can help with that. And I was like, so like from the moment, like from the moment that the idea came out of my mouth, there was immediate some more support from folks like outside of myself and outside of Derek, my co-founder. Um, and it and it's been nothing but love from within our community. One of the things that I really love about being a part of this BIPOC climbing community is that we ride for each other. Like we, if there's an issue, 
and like, or I need help with something or if I need to be connected to a specific brand that I want to work with, I can message Bethany with Brown Girls Climb and she, she's more than happy to help. And like, it's a really supportive community of BIPOC individuals just trying to do this work together. And we all have this collective understanding that we are in this together. Mm -hmm. And so we're like this, this like nationwide, multiple countrywide team of people that are doing this together. And it's, it's beautiful because this work is hard. <laughs> There's like, it's like, I honestly, I didn't realize what exactly I was signing up for when I was have to do this work like at the beginning I was like I just want to like bring this feeling that I have back to my community and like create something that can bring this feeling to to my communities and like from there it grew into this community organizing role that I did not expect <laughs> but I I welcome I welcome the role and the challenge and yeah, so it's been a really beautiful response from the community and like people just wanting to give up their time and their resources and their energy uh, to help um, us grow. And then also seeing, I feel like I've mentioned Color to Crag many times, but I feel like it was the catalyst because like that year we started and then a whole bunch of other groups popped up all around the country as well. And I feel like it, it was like we fed into each other's energy and started building these spaces all over the place for our community members. Um, and I think like where we are now as a nation where a lot of like white community members are starting to wake up <laughs> to the injustices that affect black communities and communities of color it's a double-edged sword for me right on one side of it i'm like welcome thank you for finally lending your voices to this because to be quite honest like we have been like fighting with our voices, our brown and black voices for so long. And like, we can only get so far in terms of trying to get white people to hear what we're trying to say. So that white voice is critical to the, to the fight. It's critical that white folks are talking to other white folks. And it sucks that we need that, like that we need that white voice to bring like validity to our to the conversation amongst white communities, but it's true. So on some level, it's like, great, finally, you're saying something and bringing your voice to this con this conversation within the white and within your own communities. But on the other levels, it's incredibly frustrating that like I told my partner the other day, you know, I'm like, I get so angry because there's been so much that has happened, like just horrible things that have happened, like, in my just in our generation of being alive and it's been silent 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 so on some levels it's like great i'm happy it's happening now on some levels it's really like frustrating that it took so long and that things had to get so bad before folks wanted to step into this into this realm with us and try to be supportive within this realm for, with us if, if that makes sense Totally. And thank you so much for sharing all that. It's, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot packed up in there emotionally. And I know, mm -hmm. um, that, mm -hmm. that takes a toll mm -hmm. and thanks for, you know, being here and sharing that with everybody. Um, yeah. it's very valuable and important to hear your perspective. Um, Aaron, um, how about, how about you? Do you, mm -hmm. um, how has your work and your organization uh, been received and how has that changed with this year and the sort of um, just the sort of perspective shifts that have happened? Totally. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, when I started actively seeking out other Native and Indigenous climbers, you know, it was it was through social media, through Instagram, and eventually I did find this amazing climber from uh, Red Lake First Nation, uh, Anishinaabe climber Ashley Thompson, and 
uh, I kind of just shot her a message. I was like, hey, yo, you're a native and you're a climber. <laughs> and, and we started this really great friendship. And since then, we've we've traveled, we've met up with each other. We uh, did an epic road trip all the way from Tucson to Paihunado uh, Bishop uh, to attend this uh, Flash Foxy Festival. And um, we've kind of like, you know, we, we found each other in this work. And so before this idea of Indigenous woman uh, climb, I wrote her a message. I was like, oh, Ash, you should totally do this. You know, who's someone should do this. We know, let's just start a page so we can share representation and, you know, inspire the youth to see that there are Indigenous rock climbers out there. You know, what does that mean for us? You know, what are the cultural uh, values that are represented in that as well? And so, you know, Ashley, here I am like just being all, you know, you should do it, you're amazing. But uh, she is already an ambassador for so many different indigenous organizations along with completing her PhD. And so I was just kind of like, okay, well, I'll just start, you know, organizing this social media portal, which I'm not necessarily savvy at at all. Um, and then just kind of slowly but surely started to work in that in the social media world, you know, Instagram through building imagery of representation, knowing that images and storytelling is a powerful vessel for sharing knowledge. Um, however, I mean, I did want to say, you know, that this uh, echoing summer, this work for us is it lives in community and it lives in our relationships to one another. So um, for many BIPOC communities who have needed to navigate colonial violence and how it kind of, you know, takes different form with every generation, we've really find a way that to make sure that this work belongs to one another. And so I think overwhelmingly the response within community is just like, of course, you know, there's room for you here. How can we support you? Let's grow together, you know, uh, at least within BIPOC community and BIPOC climbers. Um, and I will, I will kind of preface this by saying there's this idea that Indigenous communities and Indigenous peoples and Indigenous knowledges is something that's kind of allocated to the long distant past, right? We look at, we, we look at stereotypes and prejudices and images of indigeneity that's represented through media. And a lot of it has to do with romanticization or, you know, old age old traditionalism or, you know, this idea of a, a stoicism and things like that. And really kind of erases the fact that we're complex, uh, interconnected, growing, individuals and you know families and communities and nations uh, within a present context but indigenous communities are futuristic peoples our governance systems our knowledge systems um, our protocols and our ceremonies are all set for the next seven generations to come and so for us this work is intergenerational this work that i've inherited and i'm trying to find myself in within climbing is something that is a uh, you know, seamlessly interconnected to the work that we do in all far, par parts of our community. Like I work as a community birth doula and I work as an educator um, and, you know, a, a community researcher and filmmaker. And, and this is kind of a another extension of who we are in climbing. We don't necessarily have the choice to do this work or not. If we want to climb, we will and we do experience racism or sexism or misogyny at the Craig or in the gym. And so, you know, I'm, I'm accountable to those youth who are coming up. I'm accountable to those youth who uh, will, who do wanna see themselves climbing one day. And so in those ways, you know, for us, I really see this work as being like a, a watershed. It's really, it's, it's, it's there, it's a forever. This work will always happen as long as that, as long as we're breathing. Um, I see corporate, institutional, and social media responses as being quite sporadic, quite like this, right? It kind of goes along with the trends. Um, and so I tell people, I'm like, you know, we've been here. Um, we will be doing this work, whether, whether we have your support or not. Um, I mean, your support is amazing because we have some important work that we're trying to do, not just for our communities, but in terms of how we all re resituate ourselves in relationship that reflects reciprocity and balance to one another and to the lands that we climb and, and to the lands that we access on. And, you know, what does that mean when we do that through an anti-racist practice, when we do that through a critical reflective practice or, you know, reflective of our positions in relationship to one another? So, um, you know, I, I definitely had an increase of emails in my inbox when, uh, you know, throughout these past few months and I 
kind of just sat back and watched them correlate with the hashtags. Um, and that I'm more interested to see those, how the relationships embedded in this work will flourish. Um, because I know that this work is is long term, as I said, it's, it's intergenerational. Um, so, and it belongs to to relationship and the integrity of relationship without real relationship building, you know, this work can't really happen. And so I think that's why this work is so community driven and community based. And, you know, for those of, you know, summer and and uh, Brown Girls Climb and um, Natives Outdoors and all of these different organizations, Seeds of Sovereignty, um, you know, we know each other, we text each other, we send each other hilarious memes or whatever that word is, because we we're accountable to each other's well being in this work as well. So, um, I mean, I'm also speaking to, you know, institutionally, I'm coming out of a university setting where I was hired within a framework of uh, diversity and inclusion. So that's actually a concept that I, I personally would like to challenge because I would say, you know, diversity to what and inclusion to where, you know, I'm more interested in thinking about supporting spaces that are made um, by us and, and for us and, and, you know, that uh, reflect and are you know, have our knowledge systems built into it and our value systems built into it. We're not, we're not just add-ons or a sticky note uh, at the end, you know? So um, I'm more, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see how this work can be carried forward through ongoing relationships. That's beautiful. Thanks um, for all of that, Aaron. It's, it's interesting to think about, um, that sort of double-edged sword of how how do we interact with people that maybe we don't normally connect with or don't easily connect with versus those that we feel very like-minded or like sort of cultured or raised or spiritual um, with. And I just, um, I'm curious to have you all maybe speak a little bit to, um, you know, in individual working with individuals or potentially organizations, like for instance, a climbing gym, um, or a brand, um, who, you know, wants to work with you, but you, you look at that person or organization or brand, and you don't see a lot of things that align with your with your core values, but there is, there is a desire to, to like want to connect. Um, Summer, ha have you experienced that? Um, and, and how do you, you know, navigate that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, so uh, the Brown and Cinders were a nonprofit officially, and we have a board and all that good stuff. And one of the things that we discussed in our last board meeting, uh, was creating criteria for interacting with brands in like in terms of creating relationships and creating partnerships. So right now we're in the process of developing like what does that criteria look like? And because at the end of the day, like we have no interest in being a brand's token <laughs> for a for I don't not to be rough or harsh with it, but we don't we don't have an interest in that. We want to work with companies and with brands and um, like create relationships with these different entities that are willing to do the work in a real sustainable way, right? Like we don't want to just be um, one profile story and like some photos on their social media page because there's not very many brown or black folk on their social media page. Like, or, and like that's not what we're interested in. We're more interested in how that company or that organization is changing their internal practices in a way that can benefit uh, those future generations like what Aaron talked about that can change the landscape of what our sport looks like and change the landscape of what it means to be in the outdoors and what, what it means to belong and feel like you belong in those outdoor spaces right so it's that it's like it's it's less about like money from the brands or gear from the brands or 
like social clout or something for working with those specific brands like none of that is important like what's i mean money is important because without it we can't really do the work but in reality in reality what it's really about is are those companies really willing to put action with the money are they really willing to put like proof that they are trying to change the landscape of what it means to be um inclusive within these spaces right so that's where it starts and ends for us right now it's like we we want to make sure that when we get messages from folks that are like oh like our like our social media doesn't have very many brown or black people we want to work with you like actual messages that say those types of things we want to make sure that we're letting those folks know like that is unacceptable and no we will not work with you you know so yeah it's so yeah at the end of the day it comes down to are you authentic what are the intentions behind your ask what are your intentions behind wanting to form a relationship with us and with any other group out there that's doing this type of work or individuals that are doing this type of work. Now, also understand the importance of like not shutting people out because there's no there's no growth in that, right? Like if we're like, oh, like shutting you down, you've done it wrong in the past, we have no place for you. Like there's no growth in that, right? It, there has to be room for people to come up own, come in own their the mistakes of the past and like there has to be room for that so of course there's balance right there's room for balance within um the way that we want to form these relationships mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's um uh, it's important what you touched on that it's uncomfortable oftentimes mm -hmm. but to just keep trying to lean in and and that um it's about persistence and consistency and longevity mm -hmm. rather than you know any singular moment in time um and that it's okay to uh be uncomfortable uh because there's a lot of other people out there who have been uncomfortable or or are uncomfortable still or have been for a really really long time can i say one more thing <laughs> of course please please and like I think for a lot of people are, yeah, for a lot of people out there, they're like, oh, it's just climbing. Like we're just climbing. Um, but that's not how I see it. And it's not how a lot of our community members see it. Climbing isn't just climbing. It's for me, it's mental health, it's physical health. It's also connecting to the land in like a deep and personal way. And it's like, when you're out and you're touching the rock like you are physically connecting your body with that rock right with the energy that that rock holds and so it's not just it's not just oh we're just climbing it's just the it's just the sport it's it's making an inlet for our community to have access to this sport that's like physically beneficial, mentally beneficial, emotionally beneficial. And then it also gives us a way to get back in touch with the land and connect with the land, right? So I just wanted to say that, like, it's it's not just climbing. There's so much wrapped into it. And, yeah, thank you, Summer. Uh, actually, that's, that's a beautiful connection to our earlier conversation with Memphis Rocks and with Climb Malawi because so much of what those organizations are is way broader and bigger and more important than climbing but climbing is this access point to mm -hmm. which people walk through the door and then there's all they see all this other beautiful beautiful stuff and work and so i'm really glad that you that you said it like that it, it is climbing and it's it's not yeah. it's so much more than that um aaron did you have anything to that you wanted to add or anything that that sort of triggered or or sort of like uh, made you think of yeah i love that that point summer you know because i do a lot of people do say that but like we're just we're climbing we're just doing this thing it's just about this you know why do we have to talk about these things or why do we have to make space for these types of issues um I mean, for some of us, we don't have a we don't have a choice. You know, we're born who we're born as, and and how we are raised implicates how we 
think about the world and experience the world um, and embody, you know, our relationships. And so um, whether it's climbing or whether it's, you know, birth, my work as a birth doula or whether it's like video games or sci-fi or um, pottery, I don't know, you know, for me, it, it's, they're all doorways. They're all really doorways into, into p opportunities for us to be critically reflective of ourselves in relationship to one another um, and our relationships to the land. As humans, regardless of our cultures and from where we come from in our homelands, we are a land-based people. It's the it's the thread that ties us together in a in an older um, and larger interconnected web that I think you know many cultures and many people have forgotten about and they're not conscious of and don't situate their economic, social, political, and health systems around or based on those premises. Um, so I think that there's something there when, you know, every climber knows what it's like when you spend days and days and days on end in the bush, you know, or, or, or you know, days on a, on a, uh, you know, on a summit or something like that. Like there, there's something else that takes place. And it's because you're, I believe that, you know, we're engaging with the, with the land as an agent of themselves, as a sovereign being of themselves, as a multiplicity of you know beings of themselves not just as an object to be conquered and i think if we can remember i i, I have this idea if we remember how we belong to the land and to the waters then we can remember how to belong to one another and then all those discussions around anti-racist anti efforts and diversity and inclusion and what that looks like within you know our formal organization can can make sense but there's a lot of healing that needs to happen between the relationships with humans and the land it, you know the relationships at this point really reflect relations of you know um non not consent and uh extraction and um you know violence and so obviously our relationships with one another are going to reflect those things if these are the relationships we're enacting to our you know our life source so you know you know, in my language, there's this phrase that teaches me so much about, you know, when I'm climbing, it's not just about climbing. And it's And that means kind of like who we are as a people comes from our relationship to the land. How we have knowledge comes from relationship to the land. You know, a lot of Indigenous leaders and cultures have have those teachings and and have the governance and the leadership to say hey look like we have perfected our our land-based technologies that will ensure that we will live well and in a good way for generations to come and so i really see you know this crisis of relationship and that uh, that being a place where anything land-based whether it's climbing or just going for a walk or just connecting to the land is an opportunity for that deeper learning I mean, learning is an ongoing, you know, journey. Um, I was telling my dad one time, he, you know, he was like, you know, I wish I learned, found out about climbing. And I said, well, dad, think about it. And we kind of did this thing where we had, we put the timeline of kind of like recorded first ascents in Canada. I'm, I'm, that's where I'm based. And then we put the timeline of um, kind of instances that were happening in indigenous country in Canada. And we were looking at, you know, you know, the, this is when the Indian Act uh, came into play. This is when the residential schools um, were institutionalized. This is when the Indian hospitals were institutionalized. This is when we weren't allowed to practice our ceremonies. This is when we weren't allowed to gather in groups of more than three. This is when, this is when, this is when. And you can see all of these very clear systemic and structural barriers, which allowed for us as communities to, to grow and to flourish and to express our well-being in relationship to land. Because the idea is this idea or the story of Canada or the story of the United States is premised upon the removal and erasure of Indigenous communities from their not only place and relationship to land, but their kinship to land, recognizing that our relationship is bound by like the same way that you would relate to your, your parent or your sister or, you know, a sibling or something like that. So, um, I think it's it's important for indigenous communities, at least for us to be like, well, why aren't there why aren't there more indigenous, you know, uh, representation or climbers or why are a lot of indigenous folks finding climbing in their late 20s like myself? And a lot of that has to do with being able to step back and just looking at the facts and looking at, you know, the 
different ways that we've experienced structural and systemic violence and oppression in ways that other communities have not had to hurdle over again and again intergenerationally. So I think, you know, it's, I heard in the last talk, you know, people, what can we do? And I, and I hear people saying, well, let's do more. We got to help more, you know, got to do that. But it's, that's not enough. I think, I think there's a lot of work that has to be done in terms of tangible, clear and educational commitments to understanding and unpacking racism. What does that look like in myself, Aaron, as an individual? How do I enact racism um, in, in, in my life? And then how do I have these conversations with my family? You know, I, recognizing that uh, Anishinaabe um, uh, author Leanne Simpson says, you know, the family is the microcosm of the nation. So what are the conversations that we're having in our family? What are the worldviews and lenses that we are cultivating in our families and then in our communities and then in our larger communities of practice, whether it's professional or work or whatever? So I think that, you know, when folks or people reach out and say, you know, where can we start? What can we do? It's not going to be through just the lens of having a few more photos or representation. Um, it's going to be about doing that real work to kind of under, you know, unpack what does this mean in terms of our institution's long term commitment to unpacking our own internalized racism. And then we can allow that work to expand beyond in a more meaningful, slower, intentional, and I think long term, uh, hopefully long-term and regenerative way. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, that there are um, a couple of things that you mentioned there that uh, I've been thinking about. Um, and I really love that story with your, with your dad. Um, it's almost like by understanding the historical context as far back as you can, you almost gain a perspective and a vision into the future for how long um, it's going to take to potentially heal that or just um, that this isn't just a, a moment in time or a single lifetime worth of work in any direction. And, and, and I think that this is a cool moment to sort of segue into just, you know, what does longevity look like? Um, what do what does storytelling and future stories look like so that um, there is a historical record um, that's much better and more wholesome and more honest than the record that we look back and see? Um, hmm. So, Summer, what what are your feelings on terms in terms of just like longevity and potential opportunities for cataloging and storytelling around your organization or this work or yeah um it's a good question i i think that a part of that in terms of longevity it starts with cultivating new leaders um it starts with working with the youth absolutely and uh, helping them understand uh our history our, like the true history, uh, not what's taught in most schools and where we can go from there, right? And like helping young people understand just how much they belong, not just that they belong, but that they absolutely belong in these spaces and that they have a right to exist in these spaces in such a happy way, in such a holistic way. Um, so I think in longevity, in terms of longevity, uh, that's one that's one of the places that it starts. It starts with um, helping young people younger than us, like the kids, connect um, their minds and their bodies back with the land and with this work and with their right to um, be in these places in a way that feels safe for them. Um, I think it also comes down to like helping other folks that want to do this work get into doing this work, like just all over the country. Like a part of where we are with TBA is trying to cultivate leaders in different cities and different places. I call them our community cultivators. And so we have our core group of folks that are like 
just hosting community hangouts well when we could before COVID, <laughs> uh, but hosting community hangouts uh, in their own cities. And uh, right now we're in the process of trying to find people to be the uh, coordinators for that specific group so that we can grow it. Like I said, like I'm, I'm a professor, I have a full-time job outside of this work. There's a lot on my plate. So it's like trying to find other folks that can like help in like an organizational capacity so that we can help cultivate leaders in other places. Or if there's folks who want to do their own thing that's not under TBA, that want to have their own group, like helping as a community to support them and in, in their like entrance into this work. So yeah i think it's with the kids i think it's it can cultivating leadership among youth and also just letting the youth know you belong in these places and then cultivating more leadership amongst ourselves within the folks of our generation uh to get like just help anyone who's interested in really doing this in a meaningful way like help them uh get into this work and and get going with it because it really isn't easy and it's we on top of trying to build community for like our people, we also have to deal with folks who question consistently, like why is this even needed? And even um, come to us with um, accusations of us being the problem. Like you're the problem, like you're doing this thing and you're bringing attention to the problem, therefore you're creating the problem. And that's like those types of comments are always mind blowing to me because the privilege it takes for them to be able to exist in a way where they don't even realize the problem exists, right? And the privilege it takes for them to even be able to like comfortably have that lack of awareness to the point that when it comes up, they feel like it's being manifested by the people who are most affected by the problem, if that makes sense, you know? So it's, there's a, there's a, a lot of components to it, but I think like cult cultivating leadership and and just within each other and within the youth and yeah, <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> it was a great answer, Summer. <laughs> um, Aaron, how about you? How do you feel about um, sort of storytelling, the documenting that's sort of happened up to this point, and yeah. potentially shifting that that moving forward? so that there's like a a different narrative or different set of narratives uh, mm -hmm. that create you know longevity to what what you all are trying to do yeah. well i mean i think beyond just experiencing climbing myself a lot of my own like cultural references around like what climbing looks like and what the climbing culture is is through film right so i i see again and again you know uh rock climbing films and um you know, I, you know, I'm starting to see filming, uh, filmmaking now as a practice of storytelling. My partner is a filmmaker and I've started to see the world through that, through that lens. And, and it's been really powerful to see how film can be a tool to not only share stories, but to recognize that stories are carriers of knowledge, are carriers of cultural values, are carriers of ways of seeing the world. And so often we see filmmakers, predominantly white filmmakers, making films about community content that doesn't come from the community inside out. And so I'm pretty excited and very, um, very interested to take the next steps to start producing um, Indigenous film content that features Indigenous climbers that comes from the inside out. You know, and I think there's a lot of room to support BIPOC filmmakers to be able to self-represent and self-determine our own stories with how we perceive ourselves beyond the narrative of waking up and pouring a cup of coffee, you know, and then like going for a climb and being, nice, you know, but like, what are the deeper things that we can get to and that we can share through filmmaking? I know that the North Face has supported and, and has stood in solidarity with supporting the stories of um, uh, Gwich'in leadership in the Arctic and their you know, and, and, and the stories of their resistance within that specific context. And I raise my hands to, to organizations like, like you who do that. And so, I mean, filmmaking for us is a way for us to reclaim ourselves from the past and project ourselves into the future. 
And so that's something that I'm really starting to think more about. And I'm super excited to, to be able to, uh, to contribute to one day as we move forward. Well, that's really cool. And, and I mean, my, my biggest hope for what we're doing here today, I mean, obviously it's important live in the moment, but you know, this film that we're making right now, this story is going to live on forever. And, and I really think that, um, the value and, and the potential impacts of that uh, are grand. And I, I'm so excited. Um, I, I just wanted to thank you. Thank you both. Thank you all. Um, I thought this was a beautiful conversation and um, yeah, you, you both, you, you all speak so articulately and beautifully with regard to um, your organizations and what you're trying to do. Uh, I really respect and admire that. And I, I really appreciate you sharing it um, here. So um, thanks I, so much, Sam. You're awesome. in summer. <laughs> yeah, it was um, great. Thank you, Sam. I'm so happy to have this conversation with you, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, up next, we have a video introducing a new organization uh, called All Rise. Um, we'll return at the uh, end of that for our final conversation, which is about making gyms accessible and inclusive with uh, Abby from Coral Cliffs and Mo from Paradox Sports. So hope you enjoy these films. I'll see you in a little bit. I'm Ashima Shueshi and we're from All Rise. I'm Grayston Leonard. I'm Kyle Ng. So we decided to start All Rise Climbing to address the issues of access inside of the sport of indoor rock climbing. Um, the All Rise Foundation or project got started simply by me reaching out to Kyle and that expanded into what it is today. The reason why we started it was um, originally I was really inspired by Ashima's climbing. I've climbed for a long time and I grew up climbing and I remember in about 2007 I was in New York and I saw her climbing inside Central Park and I realized it was amazing to see a kid climb um, in the city and I realized that it was really cool that like urban climbing was there because when you think of climbing you think of just like going to a gym spending money or you know just kind of like a very monoculture within it but seeing someone look at climbing differently in a more avant-garde way was so cool um i have a brand called brain dead and i had the great opportunity to collaborate with north face and the first thing i wanted to do was reach out to ashima because she inspired this idea that climbing wasn't just about the gear or the sport itself it was really about thinking differently um one thing that i thought was really cool was with the climbing and meeting her, we became really good friends and we just had the same ethos. And when all the stuff was happening recently in our social climate, we decided we really wanted to do something about it. So Grayson actually randomly hit me up and was like, hey, I got your number through another climber named Theo. And he was like, I really would love to do something with Brain Dead because I know Brain Dead. And I've heard of his gym. I knew it was an amazing gym, but I didn't know him at all but the fact that he came to me and was like hey the number thing i want to do is help underprivileged kids i think it's super important and we have to do something so that was there was um during the height of the protest there was a big magnifying glass on the basically the truth that the the outdoor industry at large wasn't inclusive of everyone in the world it, there was a significant price point to entry and people were asking questions like what are the what is the industry going to do what is the reaction going to be brain dead was raising tons of money for all kinds of charities and donations just through t-shirt sales and collaborative projects which is what inspired me to reach out to kyla in the first place and just saying you know i have a location that we can house a project in if we want to just try and do this ourselves. See if we can come up with a way to address this issue on a smaller scale. Instead of focusing on the national scale, let's think about what we can do to our immediate community inside of Long Beach. And 
part two and go so i hit up kyle just seeing if he wanted to address this issue and start this project with me and through kyle is how we got ashima involved hey right. yeah um i mean once i heard from these guys about what they wanted to do and create for this climbing community i was immediately just compelled by their ideas and of course like their energy that was um really inspiring to be part of and um yeah i feel like my backstory of climbing and how i got introduced to climbing um it feels just natural to be part of something like this where it would give other kids a chance to maybe have a similar experience as i did through climbing and meet all these people and have all these opportunities and you know find so much joy out of climbing um that we all get to do which is you know i've taken it for granted but it's something that not everyone can enjoy frequently and yeah when i was in new york i was like 6 years old and my family didn't have much but i went to the playground like every single day and there was there just happened to be a big public rock you know in central park and it's not everywhere obviously but just the coincidences and things happen and i ended up rock climbing for the first time and i was hooked and i feel like eventually i was just welcomed by this amazing community which gave me so much happiness and you know climbing is my passion and i don't know where i would be without it so it's really kind of like a, a magical sport and you get to like connect with people in nature um connect with other people connect with yourself and there's so many things that we reap from climbing that it's really unique but obviously that's not the case for every kid out there and um you know it's historically a reserved sport that's for privileged people who have the means to be able to climb and have the means to be able to take time out of their day and um bring their kids to the climbing gym or you know pay for their day passes um pay for gear there's so many different steps to it that go into being able to climb which you know it shouldn't be ex- so exclusive of a sport I think the one thing that was really important for us off the bat was um this idea that to show that brands who are for profit and people who are not part of organizations can do stuff as well. Um as amazing as the organizations are, we really want to show that also that businesses and um a way of doing projects doesn't mean that everything we make has to be making money and like businesses need to just focus on making money or marketing schemes or just doing it cuz it looks good optically. We want to be very physical and do it ourselves. So when this came out, um Ashima and I were doing an evolve climbing shoe and we had three colorways that we had to choose from and we got these samples in and immediately we were like, "Hey, you know what? Let's just donate one of the colorways and donate all the money to different organizations and then besides that, like why are we just donating to organizations like we should also just physically do something ourselves so that spe- like sprouted an idea in our heads and then i hit up immediately grace then and was like hey let's just start an organization i mean our our project not even an organization let's just do something and then he immediately was like hey let's call it all rise and we could use our place as a starting point a launch pin a lynch pin to make this happen so immediately we raised a good amount of money we had about $50,000 that we raised and we donated to different organizations and then we kept some for this one project and then am- amazingly um north face and us decided instead of taking a marketing budget we would basically donate our marketing budget towards this project as well and basically help create an amazing amazing climbing wall for the youth and grayson could tell you more so The big question is what is our project and how are we going to be getting kids into the gym who otherwise would not have access to the gym? That's the problem we're trying to solve. Um you know, we can't thank the brands backing us enough. We have Evolve, the North Face, Brain Dead, Vertical Solutions, and others are going to come, 
all working together to make this possible. And I have to give credit where credit's due because we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, One climb really inspired us. Our relationship, my gym's relationship with the Long Beach Boys and Girls Club is what's really making this possible. And that was started through the One Climb Foundation. Um, So essentially the idea is that the One Climb Foundation lives inside the YMCA, but that's not the complete experience of what belonging to the climbing gym can be. And it's not the same experience as walking into a climbing gym. So we reached out to them and asked if they would bring kids who were falling in love with the climbing experience at the YMCA to to us. The Long Beach Boys and Girls Club explained that they have relationships with nine schools inside of the Long Beach Unified School District and that the kids who get to experience my facility don't have to be exclusive to the Long Beach Boys and Girls Club. We can work with schools in the surrounding area. And then that really allowed this vision to take root. So the idea behind it is that the gym will will be a center for kids to come into on the weekends. We can house 30 to 50 kids at a time. And then the facility cost will be debited towards the fundraising that we do. And the idea is that this is a scalable program that can be recreated in other cities simply through a climbing gym's relationship with their local boys and girls club. And the big concern on a lot of the gyms is facility wear and tear staffing hours even if we were to bring in kids who's monitoring the situation how are the costs being absorbed and paid for and that's where me and kyle really got like-minded on you know we don't need to think about it all that much let's just take action he saw what fun the power of fundraising and the like-minded basically this collective state of mind that is pervasive across the united states right now we don't need people's permission we can all collectively fund this project together and I think that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. The main thing, what we identified was that a lot of these kids from um, marginalized communities didn't really understand what climbing was. I'd hear things from Hispanic families like, why do we want to climb? Like, like we have no relationship to it. Black families just like, I don't want to climb. I don't know anything about it. And we realized, is it because that just randomly people of these colors just don't want to climb? Like... That made no sense to us. And what we realized is all a, basically it was all a, um, what do you call it? It was all just based off their underprivileged, like social economic state. Right. And they were never shown that this was possible, even though it's a free sport it has only been marketed to people of money from, for the most part. Um, unlike Ashima who basically stumbled upon rock climbing, a lot of people in the inner cities don't even really know that you can do it. So not only do we decide that, hey, this thing is that we have to target under marginalized kids, but these kids just have no money too. So a big part of this program was to figure out a way that to inspire kids, but as they go through the program, they can inherently make it their life and become a career. So if you are someone who gets to go climbing, part of the Boys and Girls Club, you can learn how to climb. If you decide you wanna get serious, you can get a scholarship from the first gym would be Long Beach Rising, and then you would be a sponsored climber as far as getting free memberships. That said, you can then compete and get trained with the youth team that'd be the All Rise Youth Team. And as you go on and you get older, you can then apply to get a belay certification and a teaching certification from All Rise to then teach kids and get paid to do it. So we love this idea of a full circle project that you grow into it and actually take ownership of it, of climbing yourself and take ownership and have pride into what you do. This will not only just be for climbing, but we believe that it could be in anything outdoors, whether it's surfing, outdoor trail running, anything. We just want people to be outside and have inner city kids realize that freedom is not just for people who have money. It's for everyone in the world. Yeah. Like a, major part of this project that we really want to you know focus on is making sure that we're supporting the local community and you know it's an accessible gym for everyone who lives around there but also making sure that you know they can they get opportunities like to work there or you know help once they eventually like graduate from this program as a kid they can like work 
as one of like the mentors um part of as part of the program and then even like work at the gym or you know meet people in the climbing industry and it's this like whole web in a cycle a continual cycle hopefully to support the community exactly i think the last thing i want to say is quote you'll have to forgive us if we left certain things about the project out we highly encourage you to visit our website allriseclimbing.com our Instagram, All Rise Climbing, to learn the complete aspect or a more succinct version of what the program is um, and how you can actually get involved and contribute to it and take part in this. Cool, I'll just do a little snippet. I think it's kind of important. The main thing that we also really want to focus on is this idea, This ex- one thing that we really want to experiment on is this idea of for-profit businesses doing more ethical things. The one thing I've noticed as a brand owner is that a lot of the people that I was really frustrated with didn't take ownership of just doing the right things and they're too worried about how their customers would see them or perceive them if they stood up for what they believed in. They were worried about the critics. They were worried about the idea that, hey, losing customers. I mean, they were worried about the critics. They were worried about losing customers. But for us, we wanted to be able to show people that a, a climbing gym like All Rise could take on this initiative and they are for profit and they don't have to be an organization and go through a nonprofit system to do the right thing. We want to show that, hey, people can get jobs and grow in our system of our free market and basically thrive, but also come from an ethical perspective. To me, ethics, capitalism, business doesn't have to be so separated and divisive. It could be all together in, in one big family and i really believe that we want to show that because that to me is going to be the future of business hey welcome back um our final conversation for the day uh for this 2020 Global Climbing Day. Um, we have Abby from Coral Cliffs and Mo from Paradox Sports with us uh, talking about making gyms more accessible and inclusive. Um, obviously, climbing gyms are a crucial part of the journey that many people have into climbing. And these organizations, Paradox Sports and Abby's Climbing Gym, Coral Cliffs, Uh, are actively working to ensure that these spaces are welcome to everyone. So um, stoked to have them here today. Wherever you are, people, welcome. Trap. We've got puppy action here, folks. It's, a, it's okay. We we are gonna roll with it. You know the climbing. Community. We have to. We have to. Come here. Climbing community is mostly dog loving. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Um. All right. Well, let's get started. Um. I'd love to just hear from you both a little bit of background on your sort of journey to climbing the journey to the outdoor recreation life um, and then you know starting to touch on just kind of your your quick uh journey to paradox sports and to um coral cliffs to your climbing gym abby so um abby why don't you go first give us a little background i am um first of all I want to say a big thank you. Hello, world. Thank you for having me. This is a real gift. Um, I am the proud owner of Coral Cliffs Rock Climbing uh, here in Fort Lauderdale. Um, Coral is a place that you go to get strong, uh, whether it be finding strength through community or through climbing. Um, I've been a climber for about 12 years, a gym owner for about nine, um, a USA climbing coach for five. And um it's been an incredible journey um abby how did you um 
get into climbing in the first place? Like most people's first introduction to indoor climbing, it happened through friends. I was invited. I had friends visiting from Europe and they themselves were avid climbers. Um, so they wanted to maintain their fitness. And so they found this little gym in Fort Lauderdale and invited me to come along. I was down. I went and I essentially proceeded to like lose my mind. I took the class. I got the gear. I got my membership and I climbed everything I could climb that day to the point where when I drove us home, my I was holding the steering wheel like this, like I couldn't close my hands. So, um, yeah, I was pretty much hooked from the get. Cool. Um, and Mo, same sort of question, you know, give us a little background to your to your personal climbing and um, yeah. also to your entry to working with Paradox Sports. Yeah, so first of all, happy Global Climbing Day. I wore my shirt from last year, super stoked. Um, let's see, I actually just crossed the 20 year mark of climbing, which is crazy. Um, I first started climbing uh, through the Girl Scouts. I went to a crazy cool Girl Scout camp where we had actual rock, big granite boulders to climb. Um, and something about climbing really stuck with me. I think it's because as a disabled person, climbing shouldn't be easy, especially missing a hand, um, which is what I'm missing. Um, <laughs> and I think because I was young, like 12 or 13, um, the idea of doing something that I shouldn't be able to do was kind of punk, kind of rebel. Um, I just really enjoyed that, especially that it scared my mom because she didn't know anything about rock climbing other than it should be scary. <coughs> Uh, so I just really latched on to climbing um, at that point, but I didn't identify with the adaptive climbing community. Like I didn't think that it existed. You know, this is pre-internet. Um, and so I wasn't really considered considering myself a disabled climber until 2009 when I got an invite to go ice climbing with Paradox Sports. Um, and that was the first time that I ever kind of climbed, even hung out socially, not even climbing. Like I never identified as a disabled human period. Like I never really did you know, adaptive camps as a kid or anything like that. Um, so 2009 with Paradox Sports is my first kind of foray into the adaptive climbing scene and I loved it and I was hooked and I've been involved with Paradox Sports ever since. Mm, okay, that's really cool. Um, I'm curious about what are some traditional or implicit barriers that you've experienced, Mo, within, you know, the, the climbing gym spaces or sort of greater outdoor spaces like you said that you know your first experience was at the ura ice fest obviously that's like an outdoor climbing festival mm -hmm. but, um maybe you could speak to that a little bit i mean so climbing is a really interesting sport because um and i think it's getting better at this but it was always to me it's felt very ego driven where everybody always wants to be the expert and there's this like kind of barrier of when you're new, you're kind of afraid to ask questions or look down upon for being a Gumby. And so I found it really hard to learn. And that's not just because I was disabled, but that's another layer of it too. You know, one of the fundamental pieces of being a climber is belaying your partner, because climbing is partnership based, and how can a one-handed person safely belay? And even if I could figure it out, who would trust me to belay them? Um, so the community aspect between how hard it can be to learn how to climb the technical parts and find partners and then layered with how do I climb um, was really tough. So I was super lucky. Um, again, I started climbing so long ago, like the nearest climbing gym was maybe eight hours away. So I just never went. So the first time I went to a climbing gym, I had been climbing and I had figured out how to play. Um, and I, I, I would say I knew what I was doing. I thought I knew what I was doing. Um, and the first time I went to a climbing gym, I felt like a fish in the fishbowl that everybody was staring at me because I stood out. They were just like, who is this chick with one hand and what is she doing here? And, and like your intentions were good. They weren't, they were encouraging, right? They're just like, you can do this. Wow, that's so cool that you're out here. But I think what people don't realize is when they're over the top kind of welcoming, it's almost pointing out the fact that you don't belong there. Like you're so surprised to see someone with a disability in a climbing gym that you're pointing out that, oh, we never have them here. It's like a new novel thing. Um, and so that was always interesting. And I ended up kind of leaving that first climbing experience with a really bad taste in my mouth, climbing gym experience. Um, and I kind of swore off gyms for a while and said, I'm just only gonna climb outside with my friends. <laughs> interesting. So it's it's almost like in, in their, in people's attempts to 
uh, welcome you, the almost the over welcoming is almost mm -hmm. repelling or something. It's repelling and smothering at the same time. Um, I always try to coach people like when working with um, disabled climbers, people with disabilities, um, that, you know, if you're cheering them on, make sure you're not doing it in a way that's any different than you would cheer on your buddy. Um, you know, maybe just a, hey, cool, you got this. But I also kind of hope that the more maybe I put myself out there, others put themselves out there. We're kind of trying to normalize the abnormal. Like one day it's not going to be weird to see someone in a wheelchair in a climbing gym. That's just normal. It's accepted. It's mm -hmm. kind of old news. That's our goal. I'm trying to put myself out of a job, really. I, I like that concept. Abby, do you recall from your first climbing gym experience um, any of that sort of implicit or 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 sort of completely obvious biases against um, you or your your mm -hmm. beginner uh, ability or uh, as your first time or you in any other way in which you identify? I think that the answer is yes. And I think that I didn't quite experience it in the gym as much as I did as a gym owner. So once I made that transition into the business side of climbing, um, I found that a lot of times, like the most common kind of transgression was when someone would see me, they would make an assessment about who I am um, and what my intelligence is and what my experience is. And so the answer is, you know, um, holding, holding tight to, um, holding tight and close to my passion for climbing and staying focused on my goal, which is to create a space where everyone can get together and get strong and enjoy this extremely transformative sport that we all love so much. Mm -hmm. um, do you work directly with your, with your staff and, and your, com your gym community and ha in having these conversations um, to try to, uh, like deliberately and intentionally craft your space differently than than most or all? I think like with all things, it's in the doing and it's by leading by example. So there are conversations that are had, however, modeling the behavior I would like my staff to engage in when someone walks in through the door, um, I have found to be the most effective essentially how I interact with them and how I interact with our, our, our members is I think the seed to them really at first, that should be step one. And then we can have conversations in and around how to execute that, you know, in terms of like real life application. So if someone, if there is a moment where someone, there is a bit of friction, cause that's at the end of the day, the foundation of my gym is to remove all of the friction of someone coming in through the door and having that really intimate experience with climbing that I've come to value as a climber and really making them aware. So some of the conversations we have are in and around what it takes someone to actually leave their home and come to your space. A lot of times, a lot of gyms think that the, the work starts as the person crosses the threshold of the door, the front door, and it's not. It's literally getting out of bed some days, especially in these last few months. <laughs> so having an appreciation for the, the labor and effort that someone makes to come to your space and valuing it um, and facilitating their experience with this incredible sport is always at the, the main forefront of our, of our behavior and of our conversations. Mm. Yeah, that's... Um... It's interesting, something popped into my mind um, is how you feel as a gym owner this year uh, mm -hmm. versus how it's been for you or, how, or the original reason why you wanted to be a gym owner in the first place. Um, do you have any sort of, sort of specific feelings or thoughts about first why you wanted to be a gym owner in the first place, but then how the difficulties and the dynamicness of this year has either affirmed or sort of uh, sort of canceled that desire or that passion. And 
No, it hasn't. Actually, it's quite the contrary. I would say um, this year has been extremely affirming because ultimately, when I first purchased the, the gym, my goal was to put, it, like a little kid, I want to share what I really love. So I put people first. I've done that since the beginning. Um, and all people, to the best of my ability. And if there's a learning curve, there's a learning curve, and I learn the thing. It might take me a minute, it might take me a few weeks, but I'm applying myself to learn and to be consistent with that. So that model for me became extremely reaffirmed and like I really just wanna double down with that more and more because a, an actual example of how that works and how far reaching it can be was a GoFundMe that was created for me about a month ago and how in a few days a crazy number was met. But more importantly, it wasn't the dollar amount of the GoFundMe that made it so impressive for me. It was that like literally the average gift was $20 and it was spread across so many people. Like to me, that was just the market telling me to all the business owners out there, that's the market telling me that putting people first is the way to go. It might be the slow way. It might not have immediate returns, but that's the way to go. Cool. Mo, I'm, I'm curious about um, paradoxes, like fundamental values, and, and if they sort of align sort of similarly to, to Abby's and to how she's running and modeling her gym and um, just almost a, a little bit of maybe history too to like how Paradox Sports was founded and how it started and stuff and just uh, a little bit of background in that regard. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go the, the quick and dirty is um, our motto is we're on a mission to make climbing accessible for people with disabilities. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, according to the CDC, one in four Americans self identifies as having a physical disability. So the number of people that having accessible spaces and reach is kind of really endless. like we're barely scratching the surface of who we can reach through these programs. Um, and Paradox had kind of a fun beginning. It started um, actually with a couple of veterans uh, based out of Walter Reed Hospital who used to climb um, kind of before their injuries. Um, and they reached out to Timmy O'Neill, who's a pro climber, whose brother was paralyzed in an accident and said, hey, we have all these wounded vets. Let's get them climbing because climbing is cool. Um, and climbing can change lives. And they did. And this was one of kind of the first ever sort of disabled climbing get togethers. Um, this is probably in 2006 or so. Um, and they just had a blast and they thought, well, what if we made this a thing? What if the need that we found here is actually needed everywhere, um, even if people don't know it's needed yet? Um, and so it kind of started with that spark and spirit of, of let's have fun and climbing changes lives. Um, and one of the really cool things that Paradox is doing and that I'm an instructor for is the Adaptive Climbing Initiative. And what we do is we send instructors to climbing gyms, collegiate climbing walls all over the country, and we do a training course on how to make your space welcoming and accessible to all climbers. And I really try to emphasize the welcoming part because the physical accessibility part, it's not that hard. You can, you can Google ADA guidelines. You can take a walk around your gym and know you could use a ramp there or that there's a hard, it's a hard to fit a wheelchair through that space. Or maybe somebody who's blind would have a hard time navigating the bathroom on their own. It's the welcoming part that really takes more intent um, and kind of more dedication and purpose. You, you can't just check a box on a checklist and have a welcoming facility. Um, and that's usually where I spend the most of my time, like to develop and get set up for the rig so someone in a wheelchair can rock climb. Yeah, it's techie and you have to learn how to rig it. Um, but what's more important there is that your staff is just welcoming to that person and there's outreach and there's, you know, opportunities there. We have a lot of people think or ask us like, you know, what's really stopped? Our gym's accessible, we're friendly. Like, why do we have to have a club night or an event or a meetup specifically for this population? They can just come anyway. But I think by having that space for them kind of set aside, whether it's time or a physical space, it really indicates that there's a place here in our home for you. Um, and I think that might help with the getting people out the front door that Abby mentioned. Is, are those programs, um, 
uh, available to any gym? Is it a combination of Paradox outreaching to the gyms to let them know that it's available and then or gyms sort of reaching out to Paradox? Like, yeah. How does, how does it end up happening on the ground? It's kind of a combo. So we've done over 70 programs to date all over the country, um, which is wild. Because I remember when we started this, we're just like, I, we have no idea if this is needed. And the last few years especially, we've had we don't have enough instructors. Gyms are reaching out to us, um, which is even more meaningful because it's not like the cheapest program. Like you have to fly two people out and all their equipment and stay in a hotel room. Um, but that's something we've actually worked uh, with the North Face on is kind of creating more of a grant program. So gyms that maybe don't have the largest budget, but has an in need population where they're at, we can help sort of offset those expenses. Cause at the end of the day, I mean, I like to work for money, but it's more important that the work gets done. Um, so however we can do that. Um, yeah, we're usually at the Columbia Wall Association Conference, kind of sort of educating people about our programs and just letting them know that we're, we're available, we're here as a resource. Oh, that's awesome. That's really uh, extensive. Um, but I mean, do you, Mo, do you know off the top of your head, like, aren't there hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of climbing gyms just yeah. in the United States? I mean, you've done 70 and that's a lot, but like, uh, there's so many more climbing gyms in the world. Yeah. Than I love the work that we do because it feels like maybe we're the pebble that causes the ripple. Um, because we also do field programs, right? Like we take people with disabilities outside climbing or we take them to the gyms climbing. But I think the biggest impact that I can have is by training other people to take people with disabilities climbing. Because if I train five people, they can each take 10 people. And that's way more of an impact than just me running a trip every weekend. Um, so yeah, I mean, the possibilities are endless and often overwhelming for sure. Um, but I just think seeing this kind of rise in awareness in the last few years um, is really remarkable. And it's kind of self-affirming that we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Abby, do you have um, some of your gym uh, clientele or even staff who, who have disabilities? Um, how, I guess, how uh, is the diversity in terms of, you know, your staff and the people who come into the gym? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is yes, uh, in terms of our member base. And it's interesting because under disability, there are folks who are also dealing with a lot of mental uh, issues as well. Um, so we've really focused on uh, helping them use climbing as a therapy. Um, so it's been, it's been an incredible um, learning process for sure. Um, realizing that what makes a person a person is so multi-layered, right? And like communicating, like I do think of climbing as medicine personally. So like helping administer it in the way that feels good for them and, um, and transformative has always been the goal. So we've learned a lot over these last nine years on how to do that. I, I wonder if we can sort of unpack that a little bit more and, and just kind of talk about or try to provide maybe a little bit of context for um, other gyms that are looking to try to diversify their uh, membership. Um, do you have anything specific or any that you do or any thoughts that you have um, with regard to how to do that? Yeah. I mean, to echo what I mentioned earlier, I think it starts at the top. I think it's it has to start from the top. So as an owner, you or owners, plural, you need to um, model uh, that, uh, that value system to your staff so that they can, again, like Mo just mentioned, the power is in teaching five people how to take someone out. And then that ripples out and again, it just, it's exponential in terms of effect. So that would be the first. And then the second would be, I mean, reach out to some of the, the folks we've spent, we've shared this wonderful platform with today. Um, paradox, there are so many people doing the good work that if you don't have the answer, 
the same way you would invest in a wall or thousands of dollars on your holds. Um, and I'm the first to love that purchase. Um, is the same way you have to invest in this aspect of your business if you really want that kind of change. But again, it has to start from the top. Yeah, that's, uh, it makes me think about a common thread that's run um, through these conversations today. And, you know, it's like also inspirational for people uh, like, I don't know if you ever thought you'd be a climbing gym owner or a community mm -hmm. leader. A, a lot of the people that we spoke with earlier never thought that they'd end up in the position that they're in. Um, but now that they're in it, they're so compelled to stay. They couldn't not do this work or this position. And I just wonder what, what it's like for you if you ever thought that you'd where you are <laughs> as, a, as a community leader, as a climbing gym owner, as a, as a role model. And because um, I really, I want people to know that they have the opportunity to be those things, even though they don't think they ever could. Um, I think that's a beautiful point to make. So the answer is like everyone else, uh, I had no clue. Uh, I just was following what I was excited about and what I loved. So, and then like with most things that you love, you want to share, right? So the answer is for those of you who are out, who are out here trying to make something happen, identify why it is you're doing it, meaning find out what you love about it because it's going to be hard. Um, it's going to be testing at times. However, if you have the patience, um, not to sound too hippy dippy or anything, but love does really like it plays out and love from what I've seen so far in this uh, little life of mine, it usually it usually wins out. So identify that thing, be clear on, on what is motivating you. And then hopefully with that love, you can pass through the trials and the, the difficulties that you'll surely face. Um, but yeah, be patient. It'll take shape. It's exciting. I think, I mean, ultimately, what else is there to do, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you, we're all better off doing something that we enjoy doing and just seeing For where sure. it goes. For sure. Uh, then, <laughs> um, Mo, how do you, how do you feel uh, about that? Like, did you ever, you know, think that you'd be a sponsored athlete, a spokesperson? Oh, hell no. <laughs> a leader, you know, um, you know, doing this good work being a, the model that, of uh, of just like acceptance, athleticism, inclusivity that you are? I guess, I guess I do feel very lucky, but I also feel like there's enough luck to go around. So I think if anybody, you know, wants to follow their, I mean, it sounds so cheesy, right? Follow your passion. But I do think if you have that positive energy around it, because you love it, um, great things will happen. You know, it, it's a little different for me, I maybe, and maybe I was also in this boat where it's like the more work I put into it, the bigger my own community grows then by default because I'm in that community I'm trying to help. Um, so maybe my drive is just that I need more friends to go climb me with that look like me. And <laughs> I'll let you belay me, Mo. Come on. <laughs> how many friends? Um, and I just think, you know, it's intimidating sometimes and it's scary because I want like, Am I pushing the right buttons? Am I pushing the wrong buttons? Am I like asking for too much from, from people? Um, but I don't know. I just think if I go ahead and stick my neck out a little bit, maybe the side effect will be something good that lots of other people can benefit from. And sometimes I might get scratched up, but you know, price of admission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's really interesting and cool. And, and, I, and I'm so happy that there's this common thread amongst all of you today and i mean myself included where it's like how did i get here <laughs> but you know i i'm so grateful but like how do i keep moving forward and doing good work and um i'd i'd like to talk a little bit on um you know a lot of climbing gyms are owned um 
and managed by white folks. Uh, white, um, sort of traditionally molded. And I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, like gyms want to step forward, brands and gyms and individuals want to step forward into being helpful. Um, but they just don't necessarily know how or don't have, you know, the best tactics with it. Or maybe they're just completely still disillusioned and believing in the, in the system, which we're all trying to change. Um, but, you know, say, say a gym or gym owner or a brand, you know, does want to lean in. Um, Abby, what, what are some tactics or some, um, some ideas that you can share that that could help them or you know smooth that transition um from you know being in this place of uh a part of the system that's that's obviously a lot of us are saying is is broken and is unfair um how, how do they help I think by first recognizing that asking that question to someone is like asking a lot of labor. Um, um, recognizing that if it were so simple and easy, you'd have the answer already. So the first thing I would encourage uh, people in a position of, of power, because that's what it is, this is what makes this system unfair is that the power resides in the hands of uh, a certain demographic. Um, so listening, essentially, the first step could be just that, listening to the experiences. If you have a diverse staff, listening to some of their experiencing uh, experiences, um, being open to listening to your customers, um, reaching out to, again, like I mentioned earlier, there are plenty of organizations um, and groups that are trying to partner with gyms um, and have been working at this for a while now because there has been such a need. I've, in recent years, I've had the, um, the, the real pleasure of going out and teaching at various festivals and having not once, but many times at the end of one of my clinics, having people be extremely emotional and um, really having a moment. And it, I mean, I'm, I'm a good instructor, but it's not because uh, of anything more than these folks getting afforded an opportunity to have patience and being taught and being cared for. Again, going back to what I said earlier, which is if the person at the top really does want to um, to share this incredible sport and again want to put folks first um, they would get the help that they need in order to create that kind of space uh, that kind of environment in their space um, uh, I can I think that maybe we've lost Abby uh Mo, do you want to um, jump in and, and sort of speak to the to that same idea of um, how do you work with other people? Yeah, I guess I will almost like kind of tag on to what Abby said with more of a maybe a word of caution. Um, because Paradox Sports delivers a program that has a start date and end date, I think a lot of ownership might be like, I'm going to pay for this program, train my staff, I'll get a sticker for my front door that says we're accessible and trained and I'm done. Um, and that's just not how it works. Like that first step is only the is the first step. That's just the start. That's just to get you familiar and aware. Um, and that's really just the work beginning. Um, the same with, you know, if, if a gym were to partner with an organization to sort of host something at their facility, um, just saying you have a partner isn't enough. It's like, how are you engaging them? How are you supporting them? How are you promoting that? How are you working towards really delivering a, an above average experience for all of those participants? Um, 
yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. And there really is no end date. Like I joked earlier about my goal is to put myself out of a job. And while that would be great one day, um, I think we always all have so much work to do that the job will never be over. And that's fine. There's always work we can do. What would you, what would you like to see, like in, in your ideal world, like, is it, is there like, um, programs, you know, weekly, monthly, is there, um, sort of continued sort of training and conversation? Is it just like this whole package of, um, progression that, you know, you'd like to see in, yeah. in terms of like what is success? I know. And what is success is so hard because I feel like um, either gym owners or a lot of us were very number oriented because like they're business folks and they're just like, what can I, what, what goal, what metric can I use? And it's kind of, it's definitely immeasurable. Um, but I think when I, when I, when I close my eyes and picture a climbing facility that is accessible, um, I think that there are people there with disabilities that are going outside of a group, outside of a program. They're there on a Tuesday lunch break, just like everybody else on their lunch break. Um, again, I think it's just that ab normalizing the abnormal. So that just the most diverse um, crew of people you can imagine is just the new normal. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately I can't say, oh, if 5% of your members have disability, you're done. <laughs> right, yeah. It's it's very strange when we start talking like numbers and percentages and Nicole, what is what is the right uh, place to be at. Um, yeah, and I think it's easy for someone to be like, well, if I can't quantify it, then why should I even try? Why start down this path that might not have an end? But um, you'll never get closer to the end unless you start, even if there is no end. Yeah. Hey, Abby, are you all um, si situated again? Can you hear? Hear us. We see you back here. I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? Beautiful. Yeah. Um, we were just talking about uh, kind of what success may or may not include. Um, and, you know, this idea of quantifying um, these things that are, you know, so human and so hard and, and so uh, emotional, sort of intangible, hard to place numbers on oh, when we have this many people uh, from these diverse backgrounds, it'll be right or, or whatever, you know, like what for you um, feels like moving towards success or toward progression in terms of um, your gym and, and just sort of its diversity and, and its sort of welcomingness. I think that one of the ways that um, six, I, the one of the ways I see success taking shape is that I'm not the only black queer woman in the United States to own a climbing gym. Um, I would love to see more of me um, everywhere um, and at a variety of levels. And to echo, you know, what Mo mentioned earlier, there needs to be a certain level of consistency and humanity in this process. Numbers are important, they serve a purpose, but without the injection of that humanity, it doesn't work long term. It's a very short sighted view of the world, I think. Yeah, if it, it feels to me, you know, that both of your organizations and and businesses are founded and rooted much more in humanity and community. I mean, there's a financial aspect to it, obviously, that sort of baseline needs to be there for the thing to work in the society that we live in. But, you know, it's, it's just interesting about how any organization like makes its list of priorities you know and and if 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 you ask somebody hey like show me your list of priorities if they could even do that and and it, would that line up with how the business actually runs because everybody wants to say that oh one of their top priorities is diversity equity inclusivity and justice but when you actually look at the day-to-day -day operation of 
the business, it might not sort of align with that. And I, I feel very much in knowing you both and in working with, you know, you personally and your organizations, like there is this human, uh, much more emotional, you know, maybe even spiritual aspect to, to the business or to the organization. And, um, was that, you know, Abby, was that deliberate? Like, did you sit down and write out, like, I want to be a business owner and I want it to look like this? Uh, no. Um, I think... Um, it's just it, who you are. <laughs> I mean, I like to roll for sure. Um, however, once I was in it, you know, and I started realizing, and I didn't realize this, and again, I really want to encourage uh, people out there. I really didn't realize until fairly recently, and I mean fairly recently, maybe three years ago, that um, I am a teacher and climbing is my vehicle, is my chosen vehicle, it's my preferred vehicle. Um, so I would encourage you all to just do that an exercise of like self-awareness and then hopefully connect yourself to what it is that matters for you and pursue it. It'll take shape eventually. Um, and it definitely needs guiding, but I don't think that, um, I don't think you pop out knowing all the answers and how things are going to turn out. That's, mm -hmm. that's, I don't think we're, I don't think we're smart enough for that. That would be too easy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, Mo, kind of same sentiment, same question, you know, about what is, what is Paradox Sports, what, is it, what does it feel like, you know, as an organization, as a group of people, you know, from its inception and its founding, like, what, is, what does it resonate when you think about it or when you interact with it? Yeah, I think one of the reasons I never um, kind of identified with the disabled community until Paradox is because it was like, very clean, almost like you would have all of these able-bodied volunteers and it was the highlight of the day to like help the poor handicapped kid. Um, that did not resonate with me. And it wasn't until I started hanging out with Paradox, who's like irreverent, they make stump jokes, they laugh at each other when they fall off their wheelchairs and they drink a lot of beer at the end of the day when it's all done. Um, I think because Paradox has that humane, like the humanity that Abby touched on, it's like we're all humans first and then whatever other stuff we bring with us is there. It's not, doesn't disappear. Um, but taking that human approach first. You know, as a nonprofit, we get a head start, I think, in finding what the soul and purpose is because we're purpose founded. Um, but, you know, we also have our own work to do. When I started, when Paradox started that ECI program, all of the instructors were able bodied. Um, now there's more disabled instructors, which is incredible and how it should be, but we're all still pretty, you know, pretty white. And so, what kind of work can we do to like keep diversifying what's a fairly small crew? Um, but you know, I can think of team members that I want to add that should be doing this work right alongside with me. So that's my own personal mission is to kind of um, talk some friends into stepping up and, and, and joining me in this crazy ride because I need them. Can't do it alone. Yeah, that's another thread running through all of this is just the <laughs> human connection is like the most important. Um, we just have a few minutes left and I, I'd love to hear you know, any parting thoughts that that you want to share about um, your organizations or just the work, just kind of anything you want the world to know? Um, is there anything that you want to say that you haven't gotten to say yet, Abby? Hmm. Now that you know better or you're aware of where you can improve do your best to, try to do better essentially um and in that process my hope is that you learn and when you will fall because you will or you will make mistakes because you will make mistakes um that you get up and try again because that to me is what being a human is and so if you are in a position of power in an organization, my hope is that you um, you commit to that kind of process. I think it'll I think it will be transformative for the 
the climbing community on multiple levels. So, and also have fun. Also, I, this is a great sport. It brings us all together. Um, have fun. That's it. My deep thoughts. No, but it's, it's crucial. You know, that encouragement about um, faltering and making mistakes, uh, but to keep showing up because we need you. We all need to, the community needs people to keep showing up, even though they, you know, falter or make a mistake so that we can all just learn that, that, that person can learn individually, but then we can learn from them. And it's like so much more holistic than just like, I made a mistake. I got turned off to that one thing. I, I'm going to go in a different direction. So I think it's, um, there definitely is profound elements to, to that. So thank you. Um, Mo, do you have any parting thoughts or anything? Yeah, about- I'll, I'll end on a not as deep, um, more anecdote. So, um, you know, the reason we're remote today is because of the pandemic and Paradox Sports, just like all human based on profits, um, we were hit hard. So not only was a lot of our funding thrown into question, um, but, you know, we're a people to people based organization. So, you know, how can we do our work when we can't be together? Um, And last weekend in El Dorado Canyon State Park was our first, finally, socially distanced, masked, appropriate, outdoor climbing day. And it was just so fantastic to have the family together again. Yeah, our community has a lot of immunocompromised or people with other outstanding conditions. Um, so it's been months of work of trying to figure out when's the right time, how can we do this? Um, and it's just such a great feeling to be back doing the actual human work again. And I'm stoked. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here and for sharing um, today. It's, it's going to be really special to see how this lives on and um something that we can go back to and and that i mean definitely be proud of i'm super proud of you both for being here and everyone else who's been a part of this today um and and just for you know the community watching live or or how this thing lives on into the future like please connect with these organizations um and these people uh on social media uh think about you know donating to their cause reach out to them you know share your stories ask questions uh they're all here and i'm here as a resource and definitely we're proud to show up like this so um please feel free to connect with us um so in closing uh you know this is the end of our live broadcast for global climbing day um really powerful conversations that have happened here today. Um, Even though we weren't able to connect physically, the goal still remains the same, which is to celebrate the community we love and the ways in which climbing can be a tool to create a more inclusive and equitable world. Um, You'll be able to find the recordings from today uh, on the North Face's channels, uh, northface.com backslash walls. This uh, recording will live on, um, and I hope it can be referenced and helpful uh, moving forward and sort of the ripples that could become big waves. Uh, please continue to follow the North Face for these continued conversations and discussions that, you know, hopefully can move our community and the world forward. Uh, I'm super grateful to have been here today and um, thanks again for joining. This is me signing off.